We're good? We're good? We're recording? Ah. No performance. Okay, but we are rec we are recording, correct? Steven? Debbie, are we recording? We are good. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Happy holidays. And again, thank you for your patience. I call to order this regular meeting of the Scottsdale Unified School District Governing Board. The date is December 12th, 2017, and the time is 515. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Vice President Kirby, will you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will have a roll call starting from my far right. Sandy Kravitz. Allison Beckham. Kim Hartman. Pam Kirby. Barbara Perleberg. All board members are present, and we do have a quorum. We will uh, start with our first item, agenda item three, approval of agenda. We will be pulling consent agenda items Q and S to be brought to the governing board at a later date. Are there any additional requests to amend the agenda? No. All right. If so, do I have a motion to approve the agenda as amended? Motion. Thank you, board member Hartman. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Board Member Kravitz. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. We move on to agenda item four. The Board President next calls upon Dr. Burwell to present recognitions and celebrations. At this time, I'll have a, <coughs> excuse me, I have a cold this evening, so if I lose my voice, I apologize. Dr. Johnson is going to give out some awards this evening. Good afternoon, President Perleberg, Governing Board members, Superintendent Birdwell and Sandra. Athletic Director Nathan Slater and I have several celebrations to share with you this afternoon. I'll call Mr. Slater up after I get through with mine. We're going to start off by celebrating some of our high school theater students. Would Abby uh, Wadups and her students from Saguaro and Marilyn Muma and her students from Desert Mountain, please join me at the podium, along with their principals, Ann Otzinger and Dr. Lisa Hirsch. Today we are here to recognize these performing arts students' outstanding performances at last month's Arizona Thespian Festival at the Phoenix Convention Center, attended by nearly 3,000 high school students from around the state. The two-day festival is comprised of workshops, competitions, and main stage performances. It is students' choice whether to compete. If they do, they work on their performances during class. They also spend a considerable amount of time perfecting them on their own. And this is outside of the scope of any school productions that may be going on at the same time in which they may be involved. So let's get to it. 20 students from Saguaro High School attended the festival, competing in such areas as the face-off makeup and tech challenges, as well as singing and acting competitions. Join us today from Sawal, our senior Elaine Denny and junior Abby Orr. Raise your hand. Awesome. <laughs> Both these young ladies received excellent and superior ratings in the duo musical category for their performance of In His Eyes from the musical The Strange Case of Mr. Jekyll and Dr. Hyde. Senior Roy Williams, raise your hand. He's not here. In contrasting monologues, he earned a superior rating and he was chosen to showcase his performance in front of the entire festival. And if you're wondering what contrasting monologues means, Roy performed a scene from Elephant Man and one from Monty Python's Spamalot. Now that's a contrast. Congratulations, Saguaro Creative Arts 
Theater. Now Desert Mountain. Erin Griffith and Serena Rego, raise your hands, received an excellent rating for their duo scene from The Apostle by Jeff Good. Daniel Kariopoulos uh, and Zach Isaac were the superior showcase winners in duo musical, raise your hands, for their performance. <laughs> for their performance of You and Me, But Mostly Me, from the Book of Mormon. And here from the group musical category, which earned a perfect score and superior rating for their performance of the song Once and for All from the musical Newsies are, step forward if you're here, the director, Grace Napolitano, <laughs> Zach Isaac, <laughs> Daniel Kariopoulos, <laughs> Alec Raymond, <laughs> and Logan Farrington. Other Desert Mountain students received excellent and superior ratings at the State Thespian Festival for Best Solo Song and for developing a marketing plan for a school production, and the entire troupe received gold honor status based on performances, service, and thespian involvement. We are so proud to share the accolades of all these students with you today. Congratulations, all. photo taken so go out that way. <coughs> Next up it's Saguaro High School again. Can I have Saguaro art teacher Michelle Peacock come up now? Ms. Peacock has been with SUSD for 14 years. She started at Arcadia Neighborhood Learning Center, now Echo Canyon, and spent four years at Mojave Middle School before moving to Saguaro, where she has been a mainstay of the art department for the past 10 years. Ms. Peacock teaches everything from Studio Art One to Advanced Placement Studio Art. Her dedication to providing quality art education led the Arizona Art Education Association to name her its 2017 Outstanding Secondary Art Educator. Thank you for your commitment to SUSD students. It's great to be recognized from your peers, Ms. Peacock. Last but not least, and this is a big group, please welcome the spirit of Arcadia High School Marching Band, Director Jan Gardner and Principal <laughs> Todd Stevens. represents only about half of the 66 members of the Spirit of Arcadia. If they had all been able to come, I'm not sure how we would have fit them all in this room. We asked the band to be here today because it won the Arizona Band and Orchestra Directors Association's Division III State Championship last month at ASU. <laughs> In 
In so doing, the Spirit of Arcadia received a superior rating with distinction and outstanding ratings in percussion, music, visual, and general effect for its performance of statuesque, in which members of the Color Guard came to life as statues in a garden. The previous week, the band won first place in the Arizona Marching Band Association's 2A State Championship. This is, yes. This is only the Spirit of Arcadia's fourth year in existence and second competing, so to achieve these accomplishments in such a short amount of time is truly incredible and a testament to its director, Mr. Gardner. <laughs> who is backed by Ingleside Middle School band instructor, Tara Hunsicker, and a staff of five, a booster board, and the volunteer help of more than 30 parents and other family members. It has been said that it takes a village to raise a child, well, it takes an army to support a high school marching band. <laughs> and we're so glad that you do. Congratulations, Spirit of Arcadia and Arcadia High School. As they are exiting, I would like now to introduce Scottsdale's District Athletic Director, Nathan Slater. President Prolerberg, Governing Board, Dr. Birdwell Sandra, the former principal, I'd like to say, go Titans, good job. Go Titans. There are a few athletic recognitions this evening. The first is the, Win the Wendy's High School Heisman Scholarship winners. This Heisman Scholarship was created by Wendy's founder Dave Thomas in 1994 in partnership with the Heisman Trophy Trust. 23 years later, more than 600,000 esteemed high school students have won this award who give back to their communities, treat people with respect, and have a 3.0 or higher GPA, and of course, excel in athletics. This year, Scasso has two Wendy's Scholarship winners in attendance tonight, and the first one is from Saguaro High School, Mr. Nick Berendrick, and if Ms. Oxinger could join us as well, Nick. Nicholas has a 4.0 GPA. He has participated in over 30 hours of community service at Miracle League of Arizona, Andre House Blanket Drivers in Central Phoenix, and Operations Christmas Child. Nicholas is a very talented young baseball player with an amazing high school baseball IQ, and he is an elite competitor. He has earned all district and AIA all se section awards as well as an all state honorable mention. As one of Sorrell's baseball team's captains, he continues to lead the program through his respectful and high character actions. It is well deserved for Nicholas to be recognized as a Wednesday, Wendy's Heisman winner as an individual who continues to lead his classmates, teammates, and his community. Ladies and gentlemen, Nick Berendrick, Heisman from Sorrell High School. Another Wendy he Wendy's Heisman winner is from Chaparral High School and is Karsten Householder, if you could come up. Is Ms. Chamokas here? <laughs> the Firebirds baseball team starting catcher, Carson was Chaparral School's winner of the Wendy's High School Heisman competition and was one of only two Arizona winners and one of just 10 national semifinalists so as I'm reading this, the high school Heisman is kind of a big deal. Karsten was one of 10 national semifinalists who were invited last week to New York City to be recognized to take part in the activities surrounding the naming of college football's annual Heisman Trophy to the best college football player that was last Saturday. Big deal to go to New York. Correct. Karsten used an athletic injury 
and a family history of cancer to inspire him to create a medical doctor's club at Chaparral, through which fellow students explore careers in healthcare. He even set up a tour of the club of the, at the world-renowned TGen Genetics Lab here in Phoenix. He volunteers regularly at FORCE, facing our risk of cancer empowered, which helps improve the lives of individuals of families affected by hereditary cancer. We'd also like to add that he was just found this week that he's been named as a Flynn Scholarship semifinalist. And my guess is that GPA is somewhere in that four point plus area because he's just been accepted to Stanford University. Congratulations, Carson. Good job, man. We got swimming dive back here. Next, we would like our Division II Chaparral Swim and Dive State Champions to come forward too with Ms. Chamokas, if possible, and Coach Ritchie. Got you on a yo-yo over there. Stay close, Ms. Chamokas. <laughs> Don't have your red vest on today. This is the Chaparral boys and girls, separate but the same team, both of which won the Division II state championship in swim and dive. For the boys swim and dive team, they had an undefeated regular dual meet season going 6-0 and and had two second place team finishes at the Brophy Invitational and the Phoenix Country Day Invitational, as well as winning our own All District Invitational. The Firebirds were led by Captains Sam Ackerson and Cole Rodriguez. You guys here today? No? The boys, teams, the boys team had 16 swimmers qualify for state, nine of them freshmen or sophomores. Yes, and had several state event championships in the 200 medley relay, the 200 free relay, the 200 IM, the 200 breast, and the 100 best breast. Matt LeBlanc was named the Arizona High School Swim Coaches Association Boys Swimmer of the Meet. Chaparral had their most dominant performance of the season, scoring the most points in Chaparral history, 364, in the Division II state meet and brought home their second straight state championship. Congratulations to the boys. The girls also had an undefeated dual meet season going 6-0 and and also won three first place finishes at the Brophy Invitational, Phoenix Country Day Invitational, and our District Invitational. It was a special season to the great senior leadership of Captains Kelly Huffer and Madison LeBlanc. 19 swimmers and four divers qualified for state, 11 of them freshmen, the most in chaparral history. They had, they had uh, the Arizona High School Swimmers Coaches Association Swimmer of the Meet and Ashley Strauss, as well as the Swim Coaches Association Diver of the Meet, Mia Waters. At the state meet, Chaparral showed their dominance by scoring the most points, 554, in the state meet history in the state of Arizona. They got such high totals by winning 10 of 12 events and brought home their fourth straight state championship. Congratulations, Chaparral girls, Chaparral boys, swim and dive teams. Congratulations. <laughs> Who's that? Um, Abby Archer. She's not here. She's not here. Okay, last but not least, we're gonna bring in the world-renowned now, Sawal High School football team. Joined by <laughs> Coach Frank Rubin, Coach Jason Mons, and Miss Oxinger, if you could come up as well again. Athletic Director Craig Luchner could not be here this evening. Yeah, fill it in. 
Yeah. Put the trophy in the front there, Mr. Court. There you go, buddy. <laughs> Yeah, you guys can slide back too. I think I could stand up here and speak for quite a while about these, uh, these fine young men and this amazing program, but I'll hit some of the highlights. 2017, Sorrell High School won their fifth straight state championship by beating South Point Catholic 28-7 last Saturday down in Tucson at the University of Arizona Stadium. 28-7, fifth in a row. The Sabercats have won 10 state titles in the past 12 years and 11th overall. Several players have been selected to the all-district, all-region, all-state teams, and many players continue to be awarded the opportunity to play football at the next level. 35 members of the varsity team currently have a cumulative GPA of 3.0 or higher, 15 players 3.5 or higher, and 6 with a 4.0 or higher. Coach Mons, uh, before I talk briefly about Coach Mons, is Coach Rubin, who's a huge part of the Sorrell community, has been there for all 10 of these 12 seasons where the state championships have been won. So Mr. Rubin, thank you for all that you do for athletics in this organization and for the Sorrell football team. <laughs> also, Coach Mons, Coach Mons uh, has been named the West coach for the U.S. Army All-American Bowl in San Antonio, Texas on January, 20, uh, January 6th of 2018, which is a huge honor. Congratulations, Coach Mons. Also on Sunday, the Arizona Cardinals, uh, at the Arizona Cardinal game, J Jason was named the Cardinals and Wells Fargo High School Coach of the Year. During the season, 10 coaches are selected as Coach of the Week, and then at the end of the year, a local sports panel compromise of media and AIA officials select the Coach of the Year, and Jason won this award. As a result, as a result of that, Jason now becomes the Cardinals nominee for the NFL's Don Shula Coach of the Year Award, which honors high school football's coaches who demonstrate integrity, achievement, and leadership exemplified by the winningest coaches in NFL history, Don Shula of the Miami Dolphins. So congratulations, Coach Mons. Benny, being at at least eight of the football games this year to the Swirl football team, I want to congratulate you again. Thank you, of course, for promoting and supporting our culture of respect character and sportsmanship on and off the football field. Your accolades are tremendous. Your success is overwhelming, and we congratulate you a great deal. Also, before I conclude, I want to say six years ago, Sewell High School administration was uh, poised with a very difficult decision. It was one that was not popular within the Sewell football community, but it was the right decision to change leadership. And out of that, we got a young man named Jason Mons, and I'm very, very proud about being part of that decision. So Jason, congratulations again on an amazing program, continued success, and thank you very much. Thank you for those wonderful presentations. Terrific celebrations indeed. Our next agenda item is five public comments. 
I will note that later this evening, the Governing Board will be discussing the formal agenda order of business and potentially take action to move this particular item's placement within future agendas. I invite our attendees tonight to stay and hear that discussion in full. In conformance with open meeting laws, the Governing Board may not discuss or take action tonight on any matters raised during public comment that are not on the agenda. However, the Governing Board may respond to direct criticism, ask staff to review the matter, or ask that it be placed on a future agenda. As a reminder, each speaker will have three minutes. Vice President Kirby will indicate the time with a 30-second warning. We do ask that each speaker introduce themselves for clarity in the record. I would also like to note Governing Board policies KE, KEB, KEC, and KED are provided by the Board for disposition of legitimate complaints including those involving individuals. Pursuant to our policy, personal attacks upon board members, staff personnel, or other persons in attendance or absent by individuals who address the board are not acceptable. Presenters are cautioned that statements or representations concerning others that convey an unjustly unfavorable impression may su subject the presenter to civil action for defamation. In the interest of time, we ask that those present refrain from applause or reactions between speakers so that we may hear and respect all speakers. Due to the large number of comment requests, we will adhere strictly to the three-minute limit this evening. Our first public comment is from Julie Sanowski. Good evening. My name is Julie Sanowski. I have been asked on multiple occasions why employees are unhappy. I have shared with you in the past at least seven pages of scripted information on this topic directly from employees of this district. You've, you've ignored this. That makes us unhappy. To me, it seems quite simple. We, as employees of this district, are on the front line each and every day and know what needs to be done differently to improve instructional interests. We have been placed on the back line, the, at the back of the line, to provide real information to create and facilitate the necessary change. This makes us unhappy. When our new management team intentionally disengages from the elected employee organization, creates the rhetoric that we are the problem because our honesty and frustration is viewed as disrespectful, we are unhappy. When members of our district management refer to us as lazy, disinterested in working with all of our students, we are unhappy. When the conditions we work with our students in have not changed, we are unhappy. When the collabor collaborative efforts of employee groups of the last 50 years in Scottsdale are tossed aside as invaluable, we are, un are unhappy. When you state you won't survey all employees about our organizational health issues, I assume that's because you don't want to know or address the truth, we are unhappy. When you state you, can, you cannot afford to make our dedicated employees whole or pay all employees the 1.06 governor stipend, yet you hire at least 10 more management positions than previously in place, and some positions receive a double-digit pay increase, we are unhappy. When we present the signatures of over 1,100 teachers to you who have stated the SEA has chosen their bargaining voice and you blatantly disregard this, we are unhappy. When we question what is being done and the manner of how it is being done, and then we are told that if we don't like it to walk away, we are unhappy. When the moral compass of our district publicly spins out of control, we are unhappy. What makes us happy? We've been telling you. You aren't listening. Please make showing the employees of our district that they are a top priority so we can continue to make our students our priority. If you don't change the direction soon, I'm afraid the damage will take years to rectify. And I ask you, can we really afford that? Make the necessary changes to move us forward as a unified district. Thank you. Yeah, the next speaker is Jan Michael Greenberg, followed by Richard Spiegel.
For the record, my name is Jan Michael Greenberg, and I am a member of the Scottsdale, well, I live in the Scottsdale Unified School District. I'd like to first begin by congratulating all the students for another excellent month and achievements. <coughs> this board is clearly confused as to its responsibilities. To clarify, the board has a legal and unwaverable responsibility of approving the hiring of all employees and the sole responsibility to hire and evaluate an independent internal auditor, something that has been neglected. This begs the question why Mr. Hartwell was ever hired. With $229 million at his fingertips, we are led by a COO who can barely balance his own checkbook. Dr. Birdwell is well acquainted with Lewis Hartwell. He's the brother of Kay Hartwell, who is either her partner, her landlady, and according to her bankruptcy filings, the woman who financed her Corvette. Both Hartwell and Birdwell have previously listed the same address as their residence. Brian Robichaud of Hunt and Caraway is a convicted felon and a reference for Hartwell's application to be the district CSO and was a reference on Mr. Hartwell's application to be the district CSO. For Robichaud's felonious recommendation, he was awarded a $500,000 no-bid contract to draw up plans for three football fields. A football field is a rectangle, 120 yards, by 53 and a third yards. Payment of $500,000 to draw this rectangle requires an explanation. Hartwell is listed on the district as a former partner at KPMG. Amazingly enough, no one at KPMG has ever heard of Mr. Hartwell. How can someone with $44,000 in federal tax liens from as far back as 2003, who cannot manage his own finances, manage the districts? For the last 14 years, he could not figure out how to pay his taxes, but yet he is somehow qualified to disperse $229 million. The one actual job I found for Mr. Hartwell? His tenure as president of Hartwell Homes, a company he formed in 2006 and dissolved in 2008 while it was mired in litigation. It is hard to give advice to the captain of the Titanic. This board has ushered into our district the Birdwell family business, a business that specializes in creating marginalized students, demoralized educators, where accountability and trust are the exceptions, not the rule. An independent auditor could have spelled this all out for you. And amazingly enough, the person with responsibility for the independent internal audit is the chief financial officer of this district. It doesn't take somebody with an accounting background or someone who's taken two minutes to look at this board's own policies to know that that is a problem. I call on the board to direct the district's council to ask our attorney general to appoint a receiver to protect the bond, re at, <clears throat> to protect the bond receipts and assets of the district before they are all squandered. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. You very Greenberg. Much. Your time is up. Richard Spiegel. Mr. Spiegel will be followed by Benny Levinson. I'm sorry if I... Thank you. My name is uh, Richard Spiegel. I live in the Arcadia neighborhood, part of the Scottsdale Unified School District. First, I need to uh, report to you all that the Board of Directors of the Arcadia Camelback Mountain Neighborhood Association voted on Thursday evening without dissent to request that all construction and destruction activity at Hopi School be stopped immediately and no additional contracts signed involving the project until all the concerns that have risen have been satisfactorily answered and alternatives placed in front of the community. I don't think this would take all that long and any additional cost would be well worth it to make sure that we're getting it right. For myself, I'd, I'd like to touch on briefly one issue that seems to have gotten overlooked with all the concerns regarding questionable administrative action, namely the aesthetics of the design for the new school. Now that we've had time to see the floor plans, it looks like all the classrooms are being herded and clumped into a box, like a large tin of sardines. The experience being there will be like boarding a wide body plane with 353 seating on a long flight with no open seats. I hate to think of what would happen if, heaven forbid, there was some natural disaster, a fire or a crazed gunman loose. And this building is being stuck in the far corner of the property up against our neighbor's homes. Instead of a field with children playing, they will have a view of a big box. Of course, this means the playgrounds will be pushed closer to the street, which seems like a strange thing to do. Currently, the students have classrooms that are surrounded by the outside. The open air is part of the design, appropriate for our lifestyle here. 
The buildings themselves are in miserable, deplorable condition. But why wasn't the first consideration given to gutting the insides and refurbishing them, using at least some of them as a basis for a new school? Certainly the cost would be less than the $240 square foot budgeted for the new construction. It seems to me if you wanted to make public school experience look really bad, this is what I would design. Thank you. Benji Levinson will be followed by Deborah Cookson. No? Okay. Deborah Cookson then. Okay. Don't start me till I find it. My name is Deborah Cookson. Uh, I am a parent of three SUSD uh, graduates, uh, and I am a past parent council president. Um, I'd like to speak about our community history is at stake. The schools Hopi, Hohokam, and Kiva are indicative of the development of education by Maricopa County and Scottsdale in order to keep pace with the suburban development in the 50s and 60s. And in all three cases, locally prominent architects such as Joe Wong, Ralph Haver, were commissioned to build progressive campus environments uh, that have proven the test of time and are still consistent with current educational trends. Not only that, but their work has served as a foundation upon which our local cult culture has evolved. Built during an era for mid-century <coughs> modern design, high-quality construction, and significant community pride in education, the architectural design and layout of their classrooms provided small, personal, educational settings for teachers and students. At the time, the idea of the open campus was emerging as an educational design. Hopi, Kiva, Hohokam are the few remaining examples of this style of education. Um, let's see. This education. Uh, Hopi and Kiva are a few remaining examples of this education. Hopi was envisioned by Joe Bing Wong, an Arizona native who designed over 550 structures in and around Phoenix, including banks, private homes, the Carefree Sundial, and Scottsdale Fifth Avenue. He is credited with designing additions to the Valley Hole and Camelback Inn and for his work on numerous architectural advisory committees and community projects. In short, he was a force in shaping the present Scottsdale skyline. Wong aligned the building on the property with respect to True North. The placement recognizes the view of Camelback Mountain to the northeast and responds to the elements, most notably the extreme heat uh, in the design and for, uh, orientation. For all these reasons, these campus campuses are not just buildings to be demolished at the district's will. These structures are tangible markers of how our neighborhoods became what they are today and ultimately how we became who we are today. They, are, they have meaning and deserve to be respected. Unfortunately, we do not believe that the feasibility study conducted by the district sincerely took into account the historical significance. Even the State Historic Preservation Office of the Arizona State Parks and Trails Division noted in a letter to the community member Dan Drake that Hopi meets the criteria to be listed on the National Register of Historic Places. How many more seconds do I have, ma'am? Eight. Eight. <laughs> okay, well, I think that the cost of $26 million to rebuild Hopi School is outrageous. Thank you. Bonnie Bizon. Hello, my name is Bonnie Bison, and I'm a teacher at Kiva Elementary, and I'm on the SEA Exec Board. I'll find out this Saturday if my efforts to become a nationally board certified teacher were successful. I learned many, many things from this process and have seen the evidence in my students' skills and abilities, but by far the most important thing I learned from the national board was what it felt to be treated like a professional, and how important it was to advocate for best practices in our profession. Our SUSD teacher mentors, AZ K-12 coaches, and fellow candidates are some of the finest professionals I've had the pleasure of working with. 
As candidates, we were given support and resources beyond anything I had ever experienced. We were treated with kindness and respect. When things went wrong, life, when life wouldn't allow us to be the superhumans we'd like to be, we were met with compassion and grace that empowered us and allowed us uh, and allowed for our own humanity. When we talked, we felt we had been heard authentically, even if we didn't get the result or answer we hoped for. I recently read an article in Forbes magazine titled, How America is Breaking Education. The opening paragraph reads, the ultimate dream of public education is incredibly simple. Students ideally would go to a classroom, receive top-notch instruction from a passionate, well-informed teacher, would work hard in their class, and would come away with a new set of skills, talents, and interests. The writer goes on to say, despite well-intentioned programs, including No Child Left Behind and the Every Student Succeeds Act, public education is more broken than ever. The reason, as much as we hate to admit it, they write, is that we've disobeyed the cardinal rule of success in any industry, treating your workers like professionals. The article concludes saying, by refusing to treat teachers like professionals, by failing to empower them to teach students in the best way that they see fit, we demonstrate the simple fact that we don't trust them to do a good job or to understand what a good job looks like. SUSD would do well to follow the national board model. My fear is that the current direction of our district will drive away the professionals, the passionate, the overachievers, the best and the brightest. I fear that the kind of teachers that parents dream about cannot thrive in our current environment of unilateral changes that dishonor us as professionals. We have been asking you in various ways, publicly and privately, for over a year to heed our voices, to treat us as professionals. Last board meeting, we saw glimmers of hope in the board's responses. Many tonight are worried about what the changes in public comment may signal. I ask again, give us a reason to stay. Please do not try to silence our voices and please consider the fact that maybe, just maybe, we've been telling you the truth all along. Thank you. Dan Drake. Dan Drake. No. Oh. Good evening. My name is Dan Drake. I'm a member of uh, United Scottsdale and Act Now SUSD. I'm an SUSD taxpayer. Uh, first, I want to thank you for taking public comments. Uh, that's a valuable job, and it's a valuable service that you perform. But I want to note that some of these comments uh, are intended to help you see your way to do what is right. Uh, I'm not here to heal Hopi. I'm here to fix the board, Dr. Pearlberg. Um, over the last several months, the administration has received feedback from concerned parents and taxpayers regarding the 2016 bond, the rebuild process, procurement of vendors, things of that sort. We appreciate the efforts that the board has gone to to try and get to the bottom of some of these things. Listening to people, exploring things, asking for documents. That's what oversight is all about. I understand you've heard the community uh, input in some respects, at least we're told you are. Um, we want you to know that we tend to have a little more confidence right now in what an independent investigation would be if it had uh, the ability to subpoena documents, to take depositions, or to otherwise test the bona fides of the people who are talking to it. As your review that has been commissioned, I guess, by the administration works right now, anybody can tell uh, Susan Siegel, the uh, person conducting the review, that they didn't do a particular fact, and she's hard pressed to disprove it. That uh, she does not have the same powers that a lawyer would have in a lawsuit. She cannot take oath and swear people to tell the truth. So what are we focused on? We're focused on about three things this afternoon. First, the chief financial officer. We are severely challenged to understand her qualifications for the job. Uh, and you'll hear more about that. Second, the chief operations officer, uh, Lewis Hartwell, and his background or lack of background. Third, the procurements with Hunt Carraway and Brian Robichaux. 
in essence, what this board has permitted to happen is to have this project run by someone who has been through bankruptcy, by a person who can't pay their taxes or chooses not to pay them in a timely fashion, and by someone who does not have an educational background in accountancy or financial management. You'll hear more from others as, as we go through this tonight, but I wanted to thank you for your attention. Hubert Toupe. <laughs> Hubert Toupe, followed by Stephanie Swearpole. Good evening. My name is Hubert Tupai. Um, I'm a parent of two uh, uh, boys in the Scotts School District, um, and I'd like to build on the thoughts shared by my colleague uh, Dan Drake. Um, so thank you for letting me address the board. Um, I'd like to address the issues our community has with the employment of Laura Smith as fee, uh, Chief Financial Officer for SUSD. In the SUSD job posting for Chief Financial Officer, the requisition notes that a Master of Business Administration degree is required for the role and that a CPA is preferred. Mr. Smith has needed, Mrs. Smith has needed, sorry. While we understand that the board has the option of waiving those qualifications, the community would like to know what work experience Mrs. Smith had and what made her the most qualified candidate to serve as the CFO for the 10th largest school district of more than 200 school districts in the state. While Arizona revised statute 15-502 notes that other finance experience may be sufficient, our community does not feel that Mrs. Smith has demonstrated prowess in her administration of finance operation for the district. Based on a copy of Mrs. Smith's application for SUSD CFO, her only employment history noted was her director of her own firm called the Professional Group Public Consulting, Inc. Prior to her current role, Mrs. Smith was employed as a financial consultant for Higley ISD, serving at the discretion of the current SUSD superintendent who served in the same capacity for Higley ISD prior to coming to SUSD. On a disclosure of outside employment document signed by Mrs. Smith, and dated February 5th, 2017, her date of hire for the role of CFO, Mrs. Smith disclosed that she was, quote, consulting the school districts for finance advice outside of USD's hours, end quote. Mrs. Smith did not disclose in this document that she was an owner of the professional group Public Consulting Inc. or that her managing partner and the person listed on her as the reference on the application for CFO was her own sister. Mrs. Smith also did not disclose this relationship on her staff conflict of interest form, where item two on the form explicitly provides a space where the employee is to list close relatives that may benefit from business with SUSD. In a conflict of interest memorandum dated May 3rd, 2017, Mrs. Smith clarified her role with PGPC as part owner and disclosed that the district did business with her company, however, that she did not take the opportunity to disclose that her sister, a co-owner in the business, could financially benefit from business in the district. With that noted, the board should be reminded that since 2016, PGPC, the company that Mr. Smith co-owns, has received over $120,000.67.30 from SUSD. And while SUSD policy states that any requisition totaling over $100,000 to any single vendor must be approved by the governing board, we have not been able to, uh, to acquire any evidence that the board approved such approval. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Stephanie Swirepole will be followed by Mike Peabody. Steph Stephanie, no? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry if I, if I, no? Okay, Mike Peabody. Good evening, Board President, Board Members, Superintendent Birdwell, Mrs. Como. Two years ago, Superintendent David Peterson was forced out of Scottsdale Unified School District. Board, somebody on the board, some people on the board, found Dr. Birdwell. Sorry, this is vibrating. The first six months of Dr. Birdwell's tenure brought hope, and some to embattled district. Sorry, <coughs> nervous a little bit. The first six months brought hope to an embattled district. At a minimum, there was a sense of positivity to the direction SUSD was headed. There were some red flags to her arrival, plagiarism, and hostile work environment and review, but those were looked beyond and people wanting a new direction. The district seemed to be running smooth. 
2017 came with a bond and override passage. Teachers started making plans for classroom upgrades, and some schools started getting ready for rebuild or renovations. This is where I really started getting involved. I lobbied for SUSD to make Hohokam a K-8 school. 85% of the parents, 85% of the community of Hohokam lobbied for it, but we were not heard. I started hearing about, from and, about and from other parents and teachers that also felt as they were not heard. I joined with this secret church group known as the Scottsdale Coalition. And with that, we reached out to board members. We tried to effect change. Our efforts went nowhere. I joined up with some wonderful people from the coalition to help form United Scottsdale. As a part of United Scottsdale, I started to delve into the history of Higley Unified School District. I started digging into the company called PGPC. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced this one, in three site. Hartwell Homes, London, England, KPMG, the town of Litchfield Park, HUSD Construction, Hunt Carraway, Core Construction, and many, many more places and things. We found evidence of bad purchase orders, outrageous expenditures, forced teacher movements, principal relocations, pushing out of highly qualified administration, and many more items that we have brought to the board's attention. But what we mostly heard, other than some spoon-fed remarks, what we mostly heard was, crickets. Members of the United Scottsdale got so fed up that they contacted the Attorney General. The AG, the AG has confirmed investigations of civil and criminal nature. Then the SPED lawsuit. Don't even want to go there. I got 30 seconds. I'm here to announce tonight that I am a, going to be a candidate for the board in November of 2018. I will start collecting signatures as soon as I can, as soon as I get the forms. I will get more than the allotted signatures because I understand someone, for, someone challenged one of the previous board members about every signature that they wanted to get. I will get more. I'm here for the teachers and I'm here for the parents. I'm here for you. Ian, Ian Steffen. Mr. Steffen will be followed by Drew Goodman, I believe. That's written. Uh, good evening, board members. Thank you, everyone. I, I get the sense that all of you have trouble understanding why so many teachers are upset about how things are going in this district. You hear success story after success story in government board meetings and study sessions, and you must think that teachers are just scared of change if they can't appreciate all the positive things that are happening. I, I watched last month's governing board meeting and last week's study session meeting on video, and the reason for the disconnect between the districts, teachers, and the governing board became clear to me. I think you're only getting half of the story. Obviously, good things are happening in this district. No teachers deny that. Uh, but when I watch the community presentations online and I hear all the positives, I have to reconcile that with all the negatives I hear from the teacher community on the same topics. If you want the full story of what's happening in your schools, you can't rely on the upbeat, filtered version that you get through presentations. You need to talk to teachers directly in forums so they can speak safely one-on-one. -on -one. As I watched last week's study session last night, I was shocked at how little the teacher perspective is considered in some of these discussions. The Basha Accelerated Middle School discussion, for example, talked about the difficulty of providing enough math classes for students entering high school after taking geometry. But no one brought up that doing so at such a small school would entail requiring teachers teach multiple preps and, um, and multiple subjects throughout the day. In the absence of the TEA, this is already happening in other places. So I know of a French teacher in the district, for example, who teaches a different subject every hour in a split between two schools. This is poor practice. It's a recipe for low morale and high teacher turnover. No one can do a good job, or as good as we all want to do, in those sorts of situations. Asking teachers directly what discourages them will provide you with many other examples of people's frustrations. The SEA used to serve as an institution that helped to bridge that divide between what you all can see from presentations and quick walkthroughs and administrator company teacher talk sessions and what the teachers' realities are of teaching in this district day after day. But the decisions made over the last few months have negated, largely negated that ability. When the district administration learned that the SEA accidentally allowed its tax exempt status to expire, it immediately shut it out from negotiations on teachers' behalf, prohibited it from using district resources, eliminated the release time for the SEA president, and to this day 
continues to bar it from using mailboxes to communicate with non-association members, although it allows outside organizations, nonprofit and for-profit, educational or not, to do so. Imagine how SUSD teachers feel when we read in the paper that a company that spends all of the Arizona Corporation Commission for not filing proper paperwork and was led by a man formally convicted from spending public funds was given a contract when we can't even use mailboxes. If we expect our city's voters to pass overrides next year, we need them to have confidence in this district's administration and this governing board's abilities to oversee it. We cannot expect them to support a district which treats its association, teachers association, or parent groups that bring up problems with governance as enemies. We need to get back on solid footing. We need to regain the public's trust. Please sit down with us so we can talk about how that can, be, how that can happen. Thank you all. Drew Goodman will be followed by Dana Fuller. Good evening. My name is Drew Gidman. I'm an SUSD parent, a member of ACT Now, and a true professional in the design and construction industry in Phoenix. Um, I'd first like to applaud Mr. Greenberg uh, in his enlightenment of the issues at hand, but unfortunately his concerns only scratch the surface of what appears to either be blatant corruption or incompetence. I'm not sure that either is a good option. And all of this is being done under the stewardship of this Board of Governors. I'd like to follow up on what my colleague Herbert had started to say. Uh, he got into uh, Mrs. Smith's uh, co-owning her company with her sister and the $120,000 and change uh, that that company has acquired. Uh, I'd also like to point everyone in the audience and online to the Act Now website uh, and Facebook page where you can see the documents that have been acquired in evidence showing that Ms. Smith has signed SUSD purchase orders and change orders for work performed by her own company, PGPC. In a number of cases, work was performed and invoiced before purchase orders were even approved. In one case, Ms. Smith approved a purchase order on April 6 for approximately $5,900 to PGPC for CMAR services, which is construction management at risk. For the central kitchen project, however, the board did not even approve the use of the bond funds for the central kitchen project until June 6, 2017, uh, a few months in there. To summarize, Ms. Smith is underqualified for her role, co-owns a company that has paid over $120,000 from SUSC funds in the past year and frequently signs off on purchase and change orders that benefits her company and her sister's company. Moving on, how much more time do I have? Thank you. Uh, moving on, um, uh, it's my understanding that prior to working in SUSD, um, Mrs. Hartwell was employed by Higley ISD. After current superintendent uh, came to SUSD, Hartwell followed in October 2016. Our community believes Hartwell was awarded his initial role and the role he holds today because of his personal relationship with the superintendent. And there's many that think other people, including principals, have the same position. With that, I'll yield the uh, floor. Appreciate your time, and I hope you see fit to do the right thing. Dana Fuller will be followed by Keith Zolman. I'm Dana Fuller. The announcement that Scottsdale Unified School District engaged outside counsel to investigate noncompliance regarding procurement, improprieties, and conflicts of interest should offer the hope of restoring public trust. However, the reality of the situation may surely fall short of that objective. Michelle Marshall, SUSD General Counsel, wrote that they had engaged attorney Susan Siegel of the firm Gus Rosenfeld to investigate these matters. The term investigate must be used loosely here. There is nothing in place that would allow Ms. Siegel the authority to embark on the discovery process such as a lawsuit would provide. She simply will have to take things at face value. 
It is also important to note that Ms. Marshall could not use the customary term retained when referring to engaging Gus Rosenfeld for their legal services because this law firm has already been retained to give counsel on the bond sale. SUSD is already their client. Why do we have somebody who currently does work under Birdwell's direction investigate Birdwell? In fact, they have been doing business with the school district for years, at least since 2010. They are not incentivized to bite the hand that feeds them. Why do we have a firm now engaged in a conflict of interest with the school district investigate conflicts of interest in the school district? Is the goal to really get to the bottom of these issues and offer transparency and accountability? Or is it to merely appear from a public relations standpoint that you are investigating? If it is the latter, then keep Gus Rosenfeld in this role. It is also quite surprising that while the district has placed Denise Birdwell, Lewis Hartwell, and Laura Smith under what they call an investigation, all of these individuals continue to function in their normal capacity, still able to continue the business decisions and roles that the general counsel thought warranted an investigation in the first place, if they so wish. At a minimum, these individuals should be on administrative leave to mitigate potential damage to the school district or the irreparable harm of spending funds in an improper or uneth unethical way. To not do so is imprudent and irresponsible. Ms. Pearlberg, as president of the governing board, please give us some leadership in this matter. If you are unable or unwilling, then Mrs. Kirby, as a person that was responsible to recruiting her to our district, please help clean up this mess. Or any other board members, please step up. We demand our school district to function at the highest ethical standard, and we expect the governing board to ensure that happens. So if hard decisions need to be made, then please call an executive session and make them. Keith Zolman will be followed by Bert Teveld. My name is Keith Zolman. I'm a Hopi parent and Act Now member and an architect. Thank you for listening to my comments today. I'm going to pick up where uh, 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 Drew Goodman left off, talking about uh, Lewis Hartwell. In 2006, Hartwell established Hartwell Homes Incorporated, listed the domestic address for the business uh, as a Litchfield Park property owned by the current SUSD superintendent. That same property would be listed in the bankruptcy filings of the current U SUSD superintendent in 2014. To reiterate, the current SUSD superintendent was the landlord of the current SUSD chief operations officer. We have not obtained evidence that this previous relationship was disclosed to this board. In Hartwell's application for SUSD chief systems officer, Hartwell listed Brian Robichaux as convicted felon, owner of Hunt and Caraway Architects, the architects for Hopi and many other bond projects for SUSD, and he was a benefactor in millions of SUSD purchase orders to this company. He listed this person, Brian Robichaux, as a reference. To reiterate, Mr. Hartwell lists the owner and president of Hunt and Caraway as a job reference on his SUSD application form, and then, mere months after accepting the role of chief operations officer in, char in charge of bond expenditure oversight, granted his job reference, Brian Robichaux, millions of dollars in SUSD bond funds. At present, per an article established by the Arizona Republic, <coughs> or published by the Arizona Republic, the superintendent lives at the same address as Mr. Hartwell's sister. To summarize, the superintendent was the landlord of Mr. Hartwell. Mr. Hartwell listed a job reference, or as a job reference, the owner of a company that was awarded millions of dollars from the SUSD bond. The superintendent and Mr. Hartwell's sister have an agreement regarding a property rental. Our community questions whether this long history of personal relationships may have favored Mr. Hartwell in his application for employment at SUSD and the payment of what will be millions of dollars in SUSD bond funds to a company owned by Mr. Hartwell's own job reference, Brian Robichaux. <coughs> now, <coughs> uh, we have additional concerns about the selection of Hunt and Caraway own or president of uh, uh, Brian Robichaux. The concerns raised about the aesthetics for Hopi Elementary School design are certainly present, and we know they can be dismissed as subjective. What's not subjective are the facts surrounding the procurement of Hunt and Caraway and the criminal history of Brian Robichaux. As background, he was charged with Class II felony theft in 1998 for billing and collecting from the Arizona Department of Transportation for work he never started. However, he was able to plead down to a Class IV felony theft. 
In his pre-sentence investigation paperwork, the judge described that Robichaud's crime was quite, or his crime was, quote, occurred over a length of time and required outright prevarication, end quote. It further stated, quote, the defendant's excuses and projection of blame make him a risk to reoffend if it suits him and furthers his interests, end quote. His legal troubles, Bryant Robichaud's legal con troubles continues to date uh, with a current judgment against him related to a default in restitution payments to the further, further, okay. Thank you. My name is Bert de Velde. I'm a teacher and a parent uh, in the school district. For sustained interest and uh, concentration, it's always good to take a little shift, step away. So you will find some of that in my, uh, all my comments. I have two things to share, though. Uh, while some of the, uh, the issues may be unrelated, uh, or maybe not entirely, um, I just have one three-minute slot. Some of this may be communicated separately, and I'm taking the, but I'm taking the liberty to speak at public comments. It's all good stuff, and it can stand repeated attention. First, this past Saturday, Sawaro Sabercats led a first LEGO League tournament at Mojave. Now in their fifth year working with us, they have fully taken control. While I had some input, I was mostly overruled by the students, and they were right. The event was truly exceptional and well attended. I'm sorry that most of you missed the opportunity to witness some of the best of what our students have to offer. A field of 30 teams included 14 SUSD teams. I just received confirmation, and that's why I couldn't share that um, uh, previously, that Kokopai, Yavapai, and Kiva teams qualified for state. Community teams of Cochise and other Kokopai students did so as well. A Mojave team won the Judges Award for exceptional project presentation on harvesting fresh water from clouds using balloons. Hydrodynamics was the theme, and dynamic it was. Thank you, Mike Peabody, for your leadership in mentoring the Hohokam volunteers. They were absolutely priceless. Thank you, Mrs. Kravitz, for attending and even helping out with some of the cleanup. I hope you will take our conversation to heart. I communicated most of what I shared previously, but apparently not successfully. I would also like to acknowledge two other dignitaries, for they are in our community, George Jackson and his wife, Lori. They've been supporters of our programs for almost a decade now. Thank you all for showing your interest. Now, speaking of communication opportunities, I am wondering about something else. However, while I believe my next comments are entirely appropriate, I'm no longer comfortable speaking after your updated introduction, <coughs> Madam President. I'm currently doing a leadership course. Uh, one of my coaches, Julie Horwin, is right there. And uh, one of the things that I continue to understand is that it is entirely possible that what I say is interpreted completely differently, <laughs> easily, as I have recently found out. So I will no longer speak. However, I do think public discourse is valuable and a priority at SUSD. Thank you. Katie Gilbert will be followed by Brad Jardine after Katie Gilbert. Ms. Gilbert, yeah, yes. Good evening, I'm Katie Gilbert. I'm an SUSD parent. I have four children. I'm also an SUSD taxpayer. Um, I would like to continue the thoughts shared by Keith Zolman. Um, he was discussing Brian Robichaud and his history. His legal troubles um, continued with a current judgment against him related to a default in restitution payments to the former owner of Hunt Caraway. Although the superintendent claims that she did not know this information about his past crime against ADOT, she does admit knowing him for quite some time. She hired him to contract two of the most expensive middle schools in Arizona state history at Higley ISD, the superintendent's previous employer. His company, Hunt and Caraway, was then selected through a no-bid process to create a master plan for the SUSD bond project. As a result of his criminal history being made public, a letter was sent to the superintendent from his company stating that Brian Robichaud is no longer the president of Hunt and Caraway. The district has yet to provide evidence that he did not benefit and will not continue to benefit from his ownership role in Hunt and Caraway. The notice from the company to the superintendent simply stated that he had disengaged from the firm. As of today, the Arizona Corporate Commission does not show a transfer of ownership at Hunt and Caraway, thus allowing Robichaud to continue to profit from our tax dollars. We maintain that allegations of misconduct are evident in Hunt and Caraway's actions prior to vendor selection being complete. 
Timing seems to suggest that allegations surrounding cronyism with district leadership may be true. Our community questions to what degree the district vets vendors and vendor employees. If a Google search for the name of a vendor returns multiple listings related to a criminal conviction, our community alleges gross oversight in the selection of Hunt and Caraway and alleges that personal relationships factored into the selection of the firm. Why does the board believe it is appropriate to continue to allow Hunt and Caraway to profit from our tax dollars? How does the board explain how Hunt and Caraway began working on the bond project before procurement process was completed? Why did Hunt and Caraway allegedly represent itself as contracted to the project before other vendors even had the chance to submit their qualifications for consideration? To summarize the comments of previous speakers, our community has deep-rooted concerns about a fair and transparent assessment of what has thus far been a veiled series of missteps. While we applaud the SUSD's general counsel's enlistment of outside counsel to assist with an investigation of these issues, we must acknowledge that SUSD is a client of outside counsel and that any findings are at the discretion of SUSD to share with our community. While we are hopeful that the Arizona State Attorney General's investigation will yield answers to our questions, we know they may not come in time to fully encourage you, the board, to take swift moral action against this conduct. Thank you for listening. Brad, Brad, Jardine, will, Brad Jardine will be followed by Kendra Olivieri. Good evening, my name is Brad Jardine. I have five children, all of whom attended Hopi Ingleside Arcadia. I am grateful for this, the speakers this evening, for the courage that they have manifested by speaking to you about significant problems and concerns and about a specific breach of trust. Let me reiterate the questions our community has for this board the board in whom we have placed our trust. As noted by the previous speakers, we have many questions, among them the following. Why does the board believe it is acceptable for private company co-owned by CFO Laura Smith to profit from SUSD contracts? Why does the board believe it is acceptable for CFO Laura Smith to leverage her position to financially benefit herself and her sister? Why does the board believe it is appropriate to continue to allow Hunt and Caraway to profit from tax dollars? How does the board explain how Hunt and Caraway began working on the bond project before procurement process was completed? Why did Hunt and Caraway allegedly represent itself as contracted to the project before other vendors even had the chance to submit their qualifications for consideration? Why does the board believe it is necessary to tear down historically significant schools? Can the board provide detailed documentation illustrating how CFO Laura Smith developed the financial analysis she shared where she claimed it would cost $26 million to revitalize existing structures? This project and this process has been a heartbreaking experience for this community. I live approximately 300 yards from that school and have for 35 years. Frankly, my trust is shattered. You are stewards of our tax dollars, and as such, we ask you to take the following specific action. Number one, stop all Braun project work until outside counsel and attorney general's office complete their respective investigations. Secondly, immediately sever Hunt and Caraway to prevent Brian Robichaud from profiting from taxpayer funds. Three, conduct a comprehensive feasibility study using a firm capable of assessing preservation and revitalization of our historically significant campuses of Hopi, Kiva, and Hohokam. Immediately sever the public group professional counseling consulting, Inc., so taxpayer funds no longer benefit CFO Laura Smith's personal business. Immediately remove Laura Smith from the role of CFO for failing to disclose her sister was and still is a benefactor of SUSD funds. And lastly, immediately commission a search for a new administrative team, including and specifically 
a new superintendent. Thank you. Kendra? Are you Kendra? Um, yeah. <laughs> Good evening, board members. My name is Kendra Oliveri, and I'm a senior at Chaparral, and I love it so much there. And over the years, I've grown so much, but I haven't done that by myself. It's because of my teachers and my counselors. They're phenomenal, but that's why I'm here. They're not being treated with respect. They're the ones that have given us, the students, the confidence to have a voice and to stand for what's right, just like what I'm doing here. My teachers and counselors are the people that have been on my side all these years, not you. So why are they be tr being treated with such disrespect? Why is there no communication within this community? And this goes for the administrators too. They don't feel the need to communicate with anyone. New, when new regulations are implemented, they're just thrown in our faces, both students and staff, with no explanation whatsoever. We students all get our information based off rumors that we hear. And what's sad is we believe even the worst rumors because we wouldn't put it past the administration or the district to do such terrible things. But isn't one of your core values to be responsive? Pretty sure that means to respond quickly and appropriately. This doesn't seem to be respected all that much. The other three values are to be humble, growth-minded, and student-focused. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm not really seeing these values taken seriously. To be, hum to be humble sorry, is to not be arrogant. I can definitely attest that from personal experience, I have been more overwhelmed and frustrated with the arrogance of this district and the administration than of anything else coming from a higher ranked official. To be growth minded is to constantly make an effort to be better and to move forward, not move backwards. Teachers were always happy and enthusiastic to come to school every day. Now they try to act like it, but we the students, we can sense their stress and the frustration and the feeling of being totally disregarded, and we feel it too. Letting go amazing teachers and staff or disrespecting them to the point where they feel the need to walk away, that's moving backwards. And the district says they're student focused. My school used to be a family, but now there's just fear. We're uncomfortable all the time. Whenever an administrator walks into our classrooms, we fear what's about to happen. There's such a sense of fear th throughout the entire campus. Everyone is too afraid to speak about anything. It's as though all these higher powers feel the need to implement fear in order to be in control. Who wants to be in an environment that's built around fear? Not me, not my peers. We feel like we have no voice, like we don't matter. What does that sound like? Definitely not a healthy school environment. My peers are the ones that suggested I speak, but one of them said she thought it was useless because she didn't think you guys would listen. Soon focus. We are, we feel like we are seen and not hurt, but we feel we are to be seen and not hurt at all. Our teachers are the heart and spirit of the school. They're the ones that encourage us to be our best and reach our full potential, and all students next year are losing that. Student success is le linked to our teachers and counselors. They're our most important resources, so if you don't respect them, you don't respect us. And I'm happy to be graduating this year, not only to move on, grow up, and see what my future holds, but because I'm no longer proud to be an SUSD student. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is um, item six. Board President calls upon Dr. Birdwell to present the superintendent's comments. Thank you, Governing Board. Uh, see if my voice lasts through this, but first I want to uh, just reflect. I appreciate that IT has put the teacher outstanding educators up for everybody to see. We had technical difficulties when we presented those. And to remind everybody, the next group of teachers that will be bringing forward will be in February, and we are excited to celebrate great teachers. On December 1st, uh, we wrapped up the phase one of open enrollment uh, for the 18-19 school year, and before the winter break begins, parents uh, will know the status of their students' applications. Roughly 1,400 parents submitted open enrollment in Scottsdale. We're very excited about welcoming them to the Scottsdale family. And the applications are still being accepted for next year, and our time and date stamped as they come online. Uh, we won't be able to make decisions on those until we find out uh, how many of the phase one students were actually enrolled. 
uh, and then we'll continue that process to make sure that we open a seat for as many students as possible, with the exception of Captain Hopi. Uh, as you probably know, uh, many of our schools hold Veterans Day celebrations, and we're pretty um, appreciative of all of that that goes across the district, but I particularly want to highlight a couple things that occurred during Veterans Day. And uh, one of our outstanding schools, Cochise Elementary School, for years have, uh, have done some, some great projects. In, in, in addition, I want to draw your attention to a project that was at Tonalia K-8, and it's been going on for years. In conjunction with an annual campaign sponsored by KMLE Radio, it's called Letters to Our Troops. And the students pen a letter to the members of the U.S. military who are stationed overseas to tell them how much we appreciate their service. And this year, on the direction of a retired Tonalia teacher, Rhonda Featherston, the effort was expanded to include Anasazi, Arcadia, Cherokee, Cheyenne, Copper Ridge, Coronado, Desert Canyon, Echo Canyon, Laguna, Mojave, Mountainside, Navajo, and Yavapai. We uh, had students who wrote 2,419 letters to the American servicemen and women who are serving across season. I just have to say how appreciative uh, we are that our students would recognize our troops. And I know it makes a, a big difference in the lives of our troops to receive those letters. Uh, lastly, I want to thank Mojave Middle School for hosting the first LEGO uh, League Robotics Tournament. So more than 30 teams from around the valley took place. The top nine scoring teams, and you heard Bert talk a little bit about it, uh, but the top nine uh, teams will be heading to the state championship at ASU next month. What is especially neat about this particular tournament is that it's entirely organized and conducted by the robotic students from Saguaro High School and the volunteers they recruit. And it's not um, a one and done sort of thing. These Saguaro students mentor school teams such as Mojave throughout the school year. So I just wanted to thank the high school students in continuing to mentor the younger students and what a great job and the experience that they share. And that is all that I have this evening uh, on the superintendent's report, and I, I will end there and not make any comments back to the earlier comments. Thank you. We move on next to agenda item seven, consent agenda. To review, we have pulled uh, consent items Q and S, and those will come back to the board in the future. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? So moved. Thank you, Board Member Kirby. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Board Member Kravitz. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5-0. We now remove, move forward to our next information discussion item, 8A, 2017-2018, School Continuous Improvement Plans. Continuing our outstanding work being done at the schools, our principals, their instructional leadership teams have been putting together school improvement to raise uh, academic achievement, to raise the culture on the campus, supporting our students, and at this time we'll have those presentations. Uh, last time it was a shame that, that everybody left before them, so we've moved them up forward hoping that people will stay, but I can see people are leaving, so let's get them rolling. Absolutely. President Proberg, <coughs> board members, Dr. Birdwell, community members, it is my privilege tonight to get to introduce two of our principals that will be coming and doing their presentation. Our first one for tonight is Lindsay Stoller Slover, who is the principal at Copper Ridge. So we will bring Lindsay up and her teachers, and thank you for raising the time up a little earlier. President Perleberg, Vice President Kirby, Board Members Hartman, Beckham, and Kravitz, Dr. Birdwell and Sandra. As introduced, I am Lindsay Stoller Slover, Principal of Copper Ridge School, and I am proud to present our Continuous Improvement Plan for Copper Ridge. We are a school that is very much at the heart of our community, and we pride ourselves on providing the best possible education for our students. I have here with me my administrative team and teachers. Um, who are all dressed in their Copper Ridge colors. <laughs> <laughs> except, for, except for one. <laughs> but to her credit, she didn't get I the message, it's okay. I just, she was here and I said, you're coming up with us because she's an amazing she, LRC She came teacher. to support him, but you made her come. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> she's wonderful. 
Um, so last year, teachers and I reflected on our mission and vision, and we wanted something that uh, clearly explained who we are and what we do. So with a little bit of wordsmithing, here's what we came up with. Our vision is Copper Ridge to College preparation starts here. Our mission is we are committed to quality instruction, high academic expectations, and building strong character, ensuring that each student promotes from Copper Ridge, well prepared for high school and beyond. Uh, being at a KA school, someone asks why college, and often I tell parents uh, it doesn't mean we're teaching chemistry to kindergartners. Um, it means that we have a focus on preparing students. When I used to teach freshman English, I noticed that some students came to high school very well prepared while others were not. And the beauty of being at a K-8 is that we have the opportunity to ensure that all students are prepared for high school and beyond and that it's vital that we do so. So we focus on building the staircase, which means that each grade level ensures mastery so that no student moves up with gaps or with unmet needs. Um, by thinking of the future, we are reminded to provide that challenge to each student every day, no matter what their needs are. When I review our CIP, you will see that our areas of focus align to that um, mission and vision with quality instruction, high academic expectations, and strong character. And these are two of our teachers in some spirit wear at the beginning of the year. I was, it was a third. That's okay. Yeah. Our first goal is math and reading and states that by spring of 2018, 25% of our students will show at least one quartile of growth on AZ Merit in math and in reading. And how will we get there? Because that is a lofty goal. Uh, to accomplish this, we asked teachers to identify the numbers of students in each grade level needed to meet the goal. Students track the movement in the school data room by moving students as they move with benchmark data. It is very powerful to take a student who had scored highly proficient and move them down to proficient or vice versa to take a student who was minimally proficient and move them up a quartile. And it's, our teachers have been very brave and accepting of that. Also, professional development has focused entirely on enrichment, extension, and raising the bar for all students. So far, professional developments have included using data and performance level descriptors to ensure lessons meet the level of rigor. Also, we have provided gifted and enrichment strategies, including use of gifted icons, Socratic seminars, and choice menus. So this is an image of our data room where you can see at the bottom student names have been um, moved up or down a quartile, and we did blur it just on, on purpose for um, privacy. Along with our four essential questions that we focus on, not only in our PLCs, but when we talk about data um, with our teachers. This is an example of one of our professional developments where um, teachers looked at the performance level descriptors and assessed a lesson they currently have and then modified it to meet all levels of proficiency. So you can see that it, what the difference is between highly proficient and minimally proficient. And if we're going to expect our students to be highly proficient, we have to provide highly proficient level work each and every day. And so our teachers have been working really hard to make that happen. Our next goal is rigor. Uh, so by spring of 2018, CRS will show a 20% increase in the use of rigorous practices, specifically conceptual understanding, fluency, and application, as evidenced by classroom instruction and student work. So to do that, we monitor the use of our rigorous practices through PLCs, feedback, and maintaining the high expectations. So some examples are our students in second and third grade do goal setting based on data, where they have to make a goal based on where they are on benchmarks and what they hope to achieve next time. Uh, some of our middle school teachers here are doing things like piloting the uh, DBQ-based instruction for middle school uh, social studies students. And our uh, middle school honor science students will hopefully sweep the East cyber mission again this year, Mrs. Rodriguez, three years in a row. Years in a row. Um, and our middle school honors ELA program organized a school-wide fundraiser um, to benefit victims of the hurricane. 
we do think it's vital to involve our parents and our families in ensuring that practice of rigor because sometimes it's um, it can be new especially when we're talking about the shifts in math and things like that it's it's new for families and so we want to provide um, make sure to provide that support and that communication for them so a couple of things that we do to ensure parents are involved uh, are fifth graders even though to go to sixth grade they just walk around the corner we still do a fifth grade step up night where they learn about expectations of middle school uh, we do a gifted night for elementary students middle school honors night and our for we will be holding our first ever academics night in the spring which talks about everything from third grade readiness the shifts in math and high school and middle school readiness as well so a couple of pictures of some community involvement and our students at um, a, pro a professional development. Yes, there are two teachers dressed as chefs. It was twin day and they were cooking up good instruction. <laughs> So culture is a, a goal that is very near and dear. Um, we will establish and maintain teacher, staff, parent, and student recognition programs. Uh, this is our first ever student award and recognition assembly, and these are students who were honored for being trailblazers. So we were very proud of them, and what a fun thing to do to give students awards and recognition. Um, we also have a teacher, staff, and parent of the month that's nominated by teachers and staff and it is so much fun to pull a parent in and say surprise you get to be the parent of the month we take their picture and put it up in the front office so that they can be admired all month long at our new award and recognition assemblies we wanted students uh, to be recognized not only for being excellent but also for doing what doing something well we believe all students are doing something well and we want to recognize them for that and had a lot of fun at our assembly. Community culture, we're very blessed in our community to have very supportive uh, families, businesses, and a couple of examples of that. At our fall carnival in October, we had 730 students come to enjoy. Uh, a total of 719 books were donated back to Copper Ridge during the annual book fair. And over 200 parents attend our annual spring dinner and auction to raise money for the school. So what that tells us is that we have so many resources and all of these goals that we have, are they challenging? Absolutely, but can we do it? Absolutely, because we have fantastic teachers, fantastic students, and supportive community members. So a couple of photos. This is our auction uh, at, our, at our fall carnival, our book fair, and yes, we are dressed up from <laughs> Alice in Wonderland, and another of our book fair and carnival. So with that, we are finished with our presentation, and I open up to any questions that you might have for me or my teachers. OK. okay. No question. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I just commend you and teachers. Thanks for coming tonight. You. you know, thank you, Copper Ridge. Our next school that we're going to be having do a presentation tonight is Pueblo. So I'd like to ask Shelley Hillman to please come up at this time. Good evening, Governing Board, Madam President Perleberg, Dr. Birdwell, and Sandra. I am Shelley Hummon, and I am the pr proud and new-ish principal at Pueblo Elementary. And I want to introduce my team here because I'm very proud that they decided to come. Ms. Christ, Ms. Kretzner-Bills, Ms. Sankey, Ms. Williams, Ms. Verdon, Dr. Hale, and we are joined by our amazing PTO president, Ms. Kristen Graziano, because PTO does so much for us, and we're proud to have her join us up here. So I'm going to be talking tonight about uh, our continuous improvement at Pueblo, the Spanish dual language elementary in SUSD. My father-in-law went to the Ohio State, so I thought I would play on that. <laughs> We have been working very hard. Uh, Pueblo is an A-rated school based on the AZ Merit 2017 spring data. 
We are a school of choice with a student body of, I checked it today, 583 exactly, ages two through fifth grade. We have a large preschool contingency and we're very proud of that. We are a Spanish immersion. We utilize a 50-50 model uh, in grades K through three, math and science taught in Spanish, four five, science and social studies taught in Spanish, and all target language teachers embed literacy and culture in the target language. We, t as all SUSD principals and staff members, were asked to um, come up with some school-wide improvement goals, and Pueblo faculty and staff have identified areas in the following, academic goals in ELA, math, and in the target language, rigorous instruction, culture and climate, and communication. And tonight, I'm only going to hit a few of these because they're quite numerous. So for culture and climate, so I should probably take my notes out. That would probably help. <coughs> For culture and climate, first I would like to say that upon arriving, we had a development of several what I call steering committees. Um, I'm a big believer in making sure that we have collective efficacy as a group. And so we have a communication committee, a leadership committee, a dual language committee, a PBIS committee, and a safety committee. And they're all very committed to coming to those meetings and helping me and uh, our leadership team to steer the direction of Pueblo. Um, one of the big undertakings that we have taken on at Pueblo is uh, a total revamp and refresh of our PBIS um, uh, program, Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. This is including an updated behavioral expectations matrix uh, embedded time for students to learn expectations, a new reward and ticket system, and we're very excited about our new student store, which our student council um, students are going to help fund and additionally help uh, set the price points for the student store, which is always fun. Um, Pueblo teachers and staff and administration will increase our positive culture and climate amongst one another, amongst students, amongst parents, and community as a whole. And I don't have communication in here, but one of my goals personally um, as a principal at uh, the new principal at Pueblo would be to have a positive contact with every family at Pueblo prior to the end of the school year, which is a very lofty goal, but I'm on track. And one of the ways that I'm on track is that I've asked my teachers and staff to allow me to recognize and make those positive phone calls home for students. So this today, Ms. Kratzner Bills, Ms. Tara, as she likes to be called, did bring in two of her art students, kindergartners, with their clips. And so many t um, principals, especially male principals, will have uh, the kids clip up to their tie. So they literally clip off the chart onto the tie of the principal. Well, I don't wear a tie, but um, I like to be a very fashionable gal, so I am going to take the clips home and bling them out and bring them back and present them back to the students and making those positive phone calls home today. That's always a very nice moment for a principal to call a parent who's not expecting a positive call necessarily, but gets a positive call from a principal. And the faces of the students when they hear their parents tell them how proud they are is priceless. So we too have some pictures of our new data room. We are also committed to rigorous instruction. We are driven by the big four questions as all of us are in SUSD. What do we want the students to know? Those are our goals and our expectations. How will we know what they are learning? That goes back to our assessment. How will we respond if they have not learned it? That is our intervention. And what will we do if they already know it? And that's when we get into our enrichment and more rigorous instruction. This is a picture of our new data room. Um, and you can see that we have pocket charts that represent, so the blue would be the children that are in the highly proficient, proficient category green, minimally proficient is a yellow, and the red is the partially proficient. What we've done is, in where we had data to represent AZ merit scores, we took that data as the baseline, and then we progressively physically move the cards when the students um, have another benchmark or another um, common formative assessment which we can um, use to see where their growth is. The four questions are up there represented on the orange page that drive um, <clears throat> our PLC time. Additionally, the leadership committee um, did want to adopt a theme of a growth mindset for all at Pueblo and as a very big believer in that everyone can always improve and get better, um, we are adopting that theme and trying to work on ways in which we can incorporate, 
incorporate that as uh, staff and as administration and as uh, students. It should also be noted, I didn't include it as a picture because it came out a little fuzzy because it's against the window, but um, I did also include, um, as many of uh, of course, my colleagues know, but as the board knows and Dr. Birdwell, that we as principals are undertaking um, a pretty rigorous uh, learning of our own with McCrell leadership training. And so I have a McCrell wall as well that represents my data because I'm, if I'm asking the teachers and the students to share their data, then I should be sharing my data as well. So there's a section in there for my data. So for our academic goals, I'm choosing to highlight the ones that are with regards to the Spanish language target proficiency targets. So our dual language committee has worked very hard since I have been there to examine and identify our targets based on the actual standards and our own 2017 stamp test data. And we, I'm very proud to say, have set proficiency targets now which are vertically aligned from pre-K all the way through fifth grade. We have also had a full implementation of a viable curriculum in Santiana. And I, <clears throat> two weeks ago, along with some of my colleagues up here on the, um, that teach in the Spanish language, um, did, were very lucky to take part in a full day training um, with the coaches, district coaches and myself, and including a parent night where parents were invited to come and ask questions and learn about the new curriculum, Santiana, which we're very excited about. It is a culturally relevant curriculum that is written um, in the target language, not um, translated, and we're very excited about that. The next page is going to highlight what our grade level proficiency targets are. And if you're wanting more information about what NL, MH, NH, stands for, I direct you to go to our Pueblo website where all of this is uploaded along with what the proficiency targets are. So as a group, we are working very hard to be able to s share with parents and students where students should be in each grade level. So at first grade, what should a student be able to do in the target language, second grade, and so forth all the way up. Um, we are also working very hard, as you know, that we have made the change from calling ourselves foreign language to dual language, and we have been working very hard to re-communicate that to our community, um, calling ourselves dual language now. We do have a new brochure and stickers, which I'll present to you after my presentation. And I do want to take a quick moment to give a huge shout out to Erin Helm and her communications department of Nancy, Jamie, and Stephen, um, who have been instrumental in helping me in doing all of this work in a very quick fashion. So I really appreciate them. Oh. So hopefully, uh, Stephen told me this is hopefully going to work. So we're going to escuchamos cómo aprenden los estudiantes. We're going to learn how the students are learning. And this is a example of kids, and I hope that the sound works, <laughs> of learning in the Santiana curriculum. This is in Senora Gabriel's class and Ms. Brown, who share the compañeros. And um, this is them practicing in the Santiana curriculum. Let's hope it works. Le enseña a Juan a pintar. 
I know it was a little light, but hopefully you were able to catch some of that. Um, I have really enjoyed um, being the principal, and I find it fascinating that when I walk through the campus that depending upon which class that the students are with, they will address me in either the target language or in English language depending upon where they're at, which is very fun for me um, to get to practice that. Um, uh oh. Before I close out, I just want to end by saying that I did count today, and it's just a hair shy of 50 days since I've been the principal at Pueblo. And um, shifts are of this magnitude, of course, are not easy. But I do want to thank um, the um, I, w I first want to start by uh, thanking uh, my supervisor, Debbie Barra, members of cabinet. Um, I want to thank the countless hours that Cheryl Redner and the curriculum department have spent with me, Michael Roberts, Dr. Wong. Um, last but not least, I would really like to uh, give a shout out to Julie Vasquez and Nadia Vargas who have been instrumental in helping me on understanding uh, dual language um, and what that involves. And of course, I would be remiss without saying that thank you to the staff for embracing me, the parents and the students of Pueblo and the community who have been amazing. And I really appreciate that. And if you want to know anything else about us, I do often tweet. And if you can follow us on Facebook. And if you have any questions, um, if not, I would like to present you with your new DLI stickers. Our new uh, uh, tagline that Jamie Hoffman came up with is uh, one school, dos idiomas, one school, two languages, which is pretty cool. And we really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Muchas gracias. No questions? <laughs> oh, you stole my line. <laughs> I was going to say gracias. All right. No, you should be no questions? Yeah, or just no, thank you so much. it again. I know um, the, what I've heard back has been extremely positive. And if there's anything, again, the district is committed to this program. If, if there are things that you need and support in curriculum, please do not hesitate to ask. We're here to support you. And we're just so proud of the work that you're doing. Families often talk to us about how pleased they are to be in your school. And that is a reflection of the great teachers and the staff that is there. So thank you for what you do every single day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. On to another exciting information discussion item, 8B Coronado Success Initiative Update. Oh, thank you. What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I jumped we the gun. We have more. I, am, I apologize. <coughs> We have two more. I, I am so sorry. I, you weren't quick enough, but that's all right. <laughs> please, please continue. Madam President, Governing Board members, uh, Dr. Birdwell, Sandra. We're now going to move to the SIP presentations from the middle school and the high school this evening. And our first middle school to present this evening is Ingleside Middle School, Dr. Chris Thuman. And a tie. <laughs> coat and a tie. I want coat tonight. But I, I don't see any of those clips. So. <laughs> uh, Madam President, Dr. Birdwell, Sandra, board members, thanks for having us. Uh, quickly, I want to introduce who's with me here. Uh, we want to introduce our instructional coach, instructional specialist. Oh, I'll change titles, sorry. Instructional specialist, Ms. Ronnie Scholes, who's um, celebrating her 41st year in Scottsdale. <laughs> Uh, next, um, we have Miss Ann Engel, a seventh grade social studies teacher, and I was told I would be in big trouble if I said how many years, so we're saying it's five plus. <laughs> so thank you, Ann. And Kirsten Graber, who is a brand new first year teacher from Grand Canyon, so we have the gamut of experience at the podium tonight. So thank you guys for having us here, and uh, hopefully we'll make this short and sweet, and you can see what we're doing at Ingleside. So um, part of this presentation is supposed to be to review our continuous improvement plans. Um, I know we have, they've been submitted and have been all over, whether uh, published online or whether you guys have reviewed or other places, but I included ours in the presentations, so it's there. Um, 
improving our ELA and math scores uh, across the district is pretty much a universal goal at all the schools. Um, focusing on rigor and communications at our site is, 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 is very vital. And, you know, Ingleside, this is my second year, and if I last about six more months, I could be the longest tenured principal there in the last six or seven years. So the culture and climate and getting consistency there is a huge goal for us. And I think that's something that is coming along nicely as, as each month goes by. So um, one thing we talk about is change uh, and, and, and fundamental purpose of learning, and we can't do it in isolation. Um, working together, teachers working together, whether it's through PLCs, collaboration, or just, just, just conversation and dialogue, working with families, working with one another is vital. Uh, without that, we're, we're not going to go anywhere, we're not going to move forward. So with that came, uh, being my second year at Ingleside, when we started the year this year, we have a full set of data, full set of benchmarks, and easy merit net from last year. We have a letter grade now this year. Um, so then we had, at the beginning of the year, we started with the data. Where are we? Uh, where have we been? What have we been doing? Whether it was talking aims, whether it was talking AZ merit transition through the time, through over the years. Um, we have about half our staff that's been there 15, 20 years, and we have half our staff that's been there like me, too. Uh, so we have a little different perspective when you sit in the room and talk about it. So this, I, I include some pictures of us having those hard conversations in August. You know, really looking at it and digging down and having the reality that we're there, we're doing okay, but we can be doing a lot better. Um, and um, our, we have pictures of our fancy dancy uh, new library um, tables that have whiteboard surfaces and they tilt so you can share them out with groups. I know I've had a few people attend tour and seeing us using them. So I know Mr. Gilmore stole our, our idea and is looking at getting them too. So you're welcome. So that's what the Chris's are here for. The Chris's take care of each other. Um, however, uh, one of the quotes on there, and I'm going to give credit to Mr. Wes Wagner, our eighth grade language arts teacher. That middle quote was something that he left on his table um, during this conversation. It says, we can, uh, we can learn a lot by simply having honest conversations with each other about the successes and the challenges of teaching. Uh, and that's kind of uh, a good backdrop to everything, every one of our meetings. It, is we got, at the end of the day, change is hard, as you, everybody knows. Uh, change is not easy, and having a real conversation about what's working, what's not, and where do we want to go is not easy. It's not an easy conversation. It's a lot easier to ignore some of the, uh, some of the hard conversations and move on and just and, and say, yep, status quo works. Uh, so that was a real telling um, comment. So that, that, that beginning of our PD that kind of kicked off the summer, that was something that stuck in my head and, and a few others. Oh, Lord, I forgot. I would not be remiss to not say that we are also joined by our assistant principal who's in our 22nd year in the district, Ms. Kadera, who also took these fabulous pictures and has been, she's our social media and picture expert, so all of our graphics and stuff we have is her. I can't believe I forgot her. I am so done now. I'm in trouble. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> so um, the second theme I want to talk about is ELA. Uh, at the end of the day, reading and writing is what matters. I mean, we can talk math, and math is important too, but if you can't read the question that's asking you what to figure out, you're in a world of hurt no matter if you can do the math or not. So we really had a focus this summer. Our leadership team talked about it, and we brought in uh, coming up with the concept of putting ELA in all the content areas, really working with science, math, social studies, language arts to get academic vocabulary throughout all the classes, to get consistency uh, in some of the practices we do. One of the uh, examples we've done is our eighth grade social studies and uh, science teachers, six, sixth and seventh grade as well, but uh, they took eighth grade, uh, Mr. Wagner, Mr. Blankstein, took leads on this in the summer and met all summer long, little chats. They, they, were, they were on campus a lot this summer and coming up with ideas of how to get social studies eighth grade, World War II, those, those topics into the ELA room and make them relevant in ELA where he can be working on there and then vice versa, the, the, the work going on in the social studies room to have it have a, an ELA base to it when you're talking assignments and assessment and that and really kind of double dipping. Um, and I know that's been a consistent theme down through our grades. So I wanted to let Ms. Engel speak real quickly on that because she's also a social studies teacher in seventh grade. I know she has a few things that they've done so I'll let her speak. There you go. Thank you, Dr. Thuman. Thank you to all you board members for allowing me to share what Dr. Jamie Border and I are doing in our seventh grade social studies class to improve language arts and, and um, the learning of English language arts. I also just have to take a minute and thank Dr. Thuman, our principal, and also our assistant principal, Mrs. Kadera, and our um, instructional uh, specialist, I also almost said strategist, for <laughs> allowing us to have such effective professional development this year. It has been amazing. And they have given us an opportunity to really uh, have time to dig into that student data, 
to actually um, work with our colleagues and have honest discussions about what we can do to improve English language arts um, strategies in our classrooms. So I just wanted to share a few things that we're doing in social studies. Uh, Dr. Border and I are doing DBQs, more DBQs, and more DBQs. So it doesn't matter whether we're studying Civil War, immigration, um, whatever we're studying, we're providing the students with primary documents. And they're using the, we're breaking down those primary documents, whether they be speeches or political cartoons or photos from that time period. We are breaking those down with our students. We're discussing them, we're analyzing them. And then we're asking our students to write. And we're asking them to, we're, we're posing a question to them and we're asking them to back up what they're writing with information from those um, documents. And we have seen such improvement in their writing since the first year by just using these TBQs. It's been really exciting. Another thing we've been doing is we read novels. For example, when we studied the Civil War this year, we, uh, we read A Soldier's Heart by Gary Paulson, which en enables us to really focus in on vocabulary and also to um, have really good discussions about the characters and about what's going on in those novels and to back up our content area with, what, with what's happening in those books. Um, also, uh, we're looking forward to our mock trials, which we do every year. And every seventh grade student gets to take part in the mock trials. It's really exciting. And what's really, really exciting is that we have actual lawyers and parents that come in and work with our students. And when they're working with our students, those students are analyzing, they're writing. They're, um, they're writing opening and closing statements. And they're writing uh, cross-examination. So it's really helping them improve their writing. It's helping them with their language arts skills. And it has uh, proven to be an exciting event for us. Um, finally, I just have to say, as a veteran teacher, I am learning from this professional development at our school every single day. And I'm very <coughs> thankful for that. So thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah give it up for Ann. All right. And in your five plus years, how many times have you spoken at a board meeting? Exactly. Good job. Good job. <laughs> exactly. Um, and the third, the third focus um, that we started recently, basically right around fall break, we started doing embedded instructional rounds. So we are blessed to be a Title I school still, barely, but we're still hanging in there. So we have a, a little extra assistance to, to do things for professional development, bring in, you know, put some money aside for subs and other ideas. One of them that um, Ms. Scholes and myself and Ms. Kader and the leadership team talked about was bringing a schedule where we can start um, hold, getting some subs in for a day and having people move for a couple periods, subbing in their class for a period or two, having them go observe peers, have peers come observe them, do feedback with one another. Um, so we've started that. Uh, we were actually going into our second round of it right now. However, as a first year teacher, I wanted Kirsten to say a couple words on what that's been for her from her perspective. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, so as a first year teacher, as all of you teachers, I'm sure know, it is crazy, hectic, um, trying to figure everything out, but also so exciting too. Um, but these instructional rounds, obviously with it being my first year, it's a first go at all of this. But um, I have heard from previous friends and teachers that, oh my goodness, your first year is going to be insane and hectic and crazy, and yes, it has, but with the support of Ingleside, it has been a piece of cake, I think. I have had support from Ronnie and Chris and Aaron, and it has been wonderful. It has made the first year very smooth, and I can go home at the end of the day and say, hey, we made it through, and it's good. Um, but these instructional rounds that we've been doing, so I had the opportunity to go to the other sixth grade math teacher. So a sub comes in my room just for about 20, 30 minutes, and I'm able to go to another teacher's room and just get advice and see how another classroom runs. Um, at staff meetings, we obviously know each other as kind of peers and just working together. We don't get to see each other teach, so it's such a great opportunity to be able to. I went in the other, like I said, sixth grade math teacher room, and it was encouraging for me to see, hey, I'm doing that, which is good, writing objectives on the board or things of the such, having uh, stations for kids to move around. Um, so it was encouraging and then also saying, hey, I need to pick it up here and do this. I had not heard of Engage New York before I came. 
to this district. So it's been so fun to be able to incorporate some of that. And from jumping around from classroom to classroom, I've been able to learn what Engage New York is and take the book that we're using in Glencoe and Engage New York and embed both materials for my students to just have an opportunity to learn in various ways. Um, so these instructional rounds, I actually get to go again tomorrow to seventh grade um, math teacher, which is going to be awesome. They're in a math lab, and I get to see them um, move around in the math lab. And it's also good so I can see classroom management and just get tips and hints of how to be a better, greater teacher in the Scottsdale Unified School District. Um, but again, it's been exciting for the first year, and it's gone a lot smoother with the support and with these professional development days and getting advice. Um, it's been really smooth and good so far, so it's a great opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, Kirsten. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, just to close up, um, we talk about uh, up on the board is, is, is actually something that the teachers haven't got yet. It's still sitting in my office. We just got them the other day. But we put together a... Uh, um, a little reminder of what we do every day. Now, our core purpose is strategic anchors, core value, the stuff that you, the governing board, has set and that leadership has set and we all agree to and adhere to, and it's really why we're here every day. But uh, educating and having accountability for one another is key. Um, change, as I said at the beginning, is not easy, as we know, as we hear. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I, I sit and I've been here 11 years, I sit in a lot of these board meetings. Uh, I will challenge any of these public speakers who want to come out and say this is a dog and pony show and say this isn't happening. You're more than welcome to call Chris Newman, 484-484-4910. Come on and tour Ingleside. You can see this for yourself. So to sit here and say that this is not going on at our schools, please come and visit any one of our 29 schools. I guarantee we'll show you it. So anything else for us? And with that, 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 we're done. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Thank you all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Uh, Board Member Kravitz has a question for you. Hold on, hold Dr. on. Thurman, Mr. Oh. Thurman. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you okay. for the presentation. Sorry. When is the mock trial? Spring. W will you send me an email? <laughs> yes. When it, okay, thank you. When we get the schedule set, I'll send it to the board and the cabinet to let you guys know. Yeah, absolutely. That was what I was going to say. Okay. Um, hang on one I second. Got, I got another I'm light. Here. I want to commend our seasoned uh, teacher for your leadership, but also for a brand new teacher to stand up in a board meeting and have that leadership as well. I love seeing new teachers and seasoned teachers coming together. Yes. Wow. Uh, and um, Ronnie, uh, thank you for 42 years. You are always amazing. Last year, I was so pleased to, to walk around the campus with you and hear all that uh, you were doing. So thank you again for your continued service. Bring him back. <laughs> Thank you. Board Member Hartman. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was a great presentation. Um, I had a question around, and this may not be for you, um, Dr. Thuman. I'll hang here. Why not? Okay. Some, someone hopefully can answer. I was really interested with the instructional round um, conversation and kind of teaching philosophy, kind of basically peer a lot of peer mentoring. And I noticed that it, it's achievable, at least at Ingleside, because of the additional funding that actually happens with Title I. And I'm just wondering if that's an opportunity that we have to share at other schools, particularly with you know, first year, second year teachers. So I was just wondering what that might look like from a district perspective. Yeah, I would have to defer that to uh, their supervisor, but maybe we can come back and talk about the various pieces where that is happening and how that's being done. But it is an amazing uh, process to do the instructional rounds, and again, another uh, initiative that's really working well. But what a gift. If I was, when I was a first-year teacher, I would have loved to have walked into a seasoned teacher's classroom and spend time there. Um, student teaching doesn't quite do that for us. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my, my daughter's going to be a student teacher in about another year, so don't tell her that if you <laughs> see her, okay? <laughs> All right. Okay. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one more. I didn't forget. Didn't forget our high school. <laughs> President Perleberg. Uh, governing board member, Superintendent Birdwell, and our high school presentation is 
Mr. Todd Stevens from Arcadia High School. Thank you, Board President Pearlberg, members of the board, Dr. Birdwell, thank you for this opportunity to present today. Um, I'm joined here um, physically by my assistant principal, Ms. Amy Palatucci, member of my PTO executive board, Mr. Kevin DeGroot. Um, previously, we were joined by Athletic Director Sheriff Fezemeyer, who is now uh, celebrating with our Spirit of Arcadia marching band. And we are joined digitally by members of our teacher instructional leadership team back at home, Kim Mayorga, uh, excuse me, Jen Ducolo, Gene Yeager, Clayton Guy, Richard Maxwell, and Richard Fairchild, and members of our school improvement team, Kim Mayorga, Kelly Ender, Stacy Skolnick, and Anna Patterson. With that said, I'm gonna to try to jump in. We had utilized Google Slides, and we are loaded and ready to go. We also have it downloaded in case uh, we have some Wi-Fi issues, but hopefully we are doing okay today. Um, my name is Todd Stevens. I'm fortunate to serve as the principal of Arcadia High School, and I'd like to walk you through our board presentation about our continuous improvement plan. Um, this feels organic for me. Um, generally, when we start and end our meetings, we have celebrations. And we were fortunate enough to start our meeting tonight with honoring our state marching band uh, for uh, their championship. Um, similarly, when we have our meetings back on campus, we always start with sh uh, staff shout outs. Um, that's what you'll see on the left. That's a bulletin board in our front office where peers recognize peers for their work they're doing. And we always read those at the start of all of our meetings, draw one at random for a little gift card. So it's a lot of fun to um, start with some celebrations. Uh, tonight, we'll be sure to end this presentation with some celebrations as well. At the very bottom, it says, and a link too new to post. My goodness, what I'd love to be able to have this link for you. Um, we had one of our students um, featured on Fox Sports Arizona this Sunday night for a peer um, student athlete um, tutoring group. It's called Goal. The young man's name is Jack Spear. Um, they will not allow us to post the link to it yet because they want to run it for a week and get all their advertising revenue. But we will be sure to get that out because this is a celebration uh, of Jack's work that is wonderful to share for everybody. Um, what we came in to do at Arcadia High School was grow the A. Um, the A represents a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, Arcadia is a unique community. We have immense student diversity, um, a reputation for excelling academics. We have fine athletic programs, uh, performing arts. Um, Arcadia is home to many and tradition for many others. Our goal at the start of this year wasn't to come in with big bang disruptive change um, as cautioned against um, by school researcher Adrian Pitts in Go Slow to Go Fast. Um, but we just wanted to grow our A. We started a hashtag after um, Coronado High Schools, um, hashtag Dons Will Rise, and it just became a little thing among all the, the high schools to have our own hashtag. So knowing that our focus was to grow the various representations of the Arcadia A, our hashtag has simply become Grow the A. Um, to understand our school improvement plan, we felt it relevant to, to kind of have a starting point. Um, any school improvement point, uh, plan excuse me, should have points of focus based off of real data. And we looked at several different factors as we began to write our school improvement plan. I'll walk you through some of them briefly. We did a plus delta activity um, for key initiatives. We brought in small groups to talk about initiatives at Arcadia, such as our professional learning communities, formative assessment, technology integration, and student engagement. And we utilized the feedback from these little small groups and what was going well, that'd be the pluses and things we need to make changes for, those would be the deltas, um, as conversation starters for this year's school improvement plan. And I have probably about an hour of data coming out of those. I'll bear you um, the boredom of it. But just to show you, we did it all um, via Google Forms. And we got um, various pieces of information um, talking about, in this case, student engagement, um, where about half the um, staff felt as if our current teaching um, group is equipped to maximize student engagement. So that gave us information that we need to be sure when we write our school improvement plan that we include opportunities for learning uh, professionally about uh, student engagement. 
Um, similarly, uh, for professional learning communities, this was a, a statement from uh, one small group, um, just agree or disagree, where we had 25% disagree and three quarters of a group simply state that our expectations for PLCs were, were clear and understood. That told us we had work to do in our PLCs. And I'll skip through a few of these um, to, to get to um, some of our other, other starting points. Uh, we also looked at um, learning leaders for learning schools as a starting point for it. Um, this is a Scottsdale initiative for the, the principals. Um, it's a three-year course, and we included in that a needs assessment of staff members. And what the data told us from that needs assessment of all of our teaching staff is that we do a lot of the stuff sometimes. Um, so when we were beginning to look at these, how do we begin to prioritize? We worked with our coach at LLLS, and he encouraged us, when in doubt, go with learning communities. And since that was already present from our Plus Delta days, we knew that was an area we needed to go. Um, this is where it started to hit home for us as we started to get back our um, AZ merit proficiency rates. In, in English language arts, you can see about 32, maybe a third of our students tested proficient on the state standards, and in math, just slightly more than that, 37%. Then we looked at student growth uh, over the same period, um, and you'll see here the red bars are the districts, um, percentage of students meeting their growth <coughs> targets, and the blue bars are at Arcadia. So we, we became um, very quickly familiar with the fact that our student proficiency and our AZ merit growth rates were not what we expected of them to, to be. And then finally, um, when state accountability came out and we had that letter grade C, that created all the demand that we need. Some of my colleagues earlier talked about the McCrell um, administrators, um, professional development we've been going through. One of their phases that, that they work on us with is managing change. And the key, key factor in managing change um, is having a, a demand. Uh, let me tell you, when we looked at those AZ merit proficiency scores, the growth scores, and then our state accountability label, that was all the demand that we needed. Our staff has reacted, and they've reacted um, honestly and swiftly to start to make some changes. So that was our starting point. So then as we began to build our continuous improvement plan, we ended up with three core goals, a communication goal, a culture goal, and an academic goal. And the academic goal um, focuses both on math and English language arts and contains seven strategies. I'll briefly take you through our communications goal, if I may. Um, we simply said that during the school year, we're going to utilize one-way and two-way communication between all stakeholders. I included admin to parents, admin to staff, and of course, staff to staff in our communications goal. I um, wanted to bring up a couple quick pieces for you. The first one is um, in touch. This is an example of uh, communication opportunities. We have one-way communication to our neighborhood. And in this particular case, we were having an issue with neighborhood parking and student drop-off and trying to be good neighbors. We wanted to get messages out to our community about it. And through the use of in touch, uh, we were able to deliver a pro good neighbor message to approximately 2,200 families, simply a method of delivery that we could not have accomplished without this electronic system. So we're happy to put that into use. And then down here at the bottom, I'll quickly um, click a link for our weekly bulletin. I don't want to spend much time on it, but this is how we communicate with our staff weekly. And since it's spinning, I'm going to simply say we communicate with our staff weekly. Um, we, we send out a bulletin that has, oh, there we go, um, that has the various, it flies attacking me, my goodness, um, that would have various uh, communication points. Um, always focus upon not just our classroom activities, um, as you can see across the campus, but then also that we can have collective campus focus. And in this particular week, we talked about 12 high impact words. Um, to increase standardized testing scores. Again, something we borrowed from my colleagues over at Coronado High School. And then we can also point out things. We have a shared Google folder um, that we collect various items, and we always try to highlight one of them. In this case, it came out of our um, vertical articulation PD day on November 22nd, just to uh, include some stuff about higher level DOK. So that's uh, one of the examples of how we try to communicate with our teachers throughout the week. All right, moving forward if I can. A culture goal we wrote during this particular school year, we're going to have a 10% gain um, achieved on a pre-survey, post-survey satisfaction rate regarding student perception about schools. This one's important to us. Um, I give huge um, kudos to our school improvement team on this one because they chose to have this one entirely based on students. They felt a need to talk to, uh, have our students have voices heard and to be sure that they felt positive about Arcadia High School. So our culture goal um, came out of the school improvement plan 
um, plan being entirely student-based. Um, we've invested heavily. In fact, one of our students um, in our um, leadership groups for students was here earlier this evening. She did have to leave, um, but she's featured here in this. Uh, we, we have various student groups that come together to talk about issues on campus. And in this particular case, on the left, we have a, uh, a speaker uh, for our students about accepting um, gender-based equality. And then on the right, we have a, a workshop that we did for our African-American student union, all of which led to positive interactions with diverse students. Um, similarly, we have a group um, serving on the student advisory board for the district um, and coming out of a meeting um, with them uh, led by um, Dr. Treat, um, we committed to uh, monthly parent, excuse me, student forums so that our students had a town hall with me and our first one is scheduled in January. So I, I, I'm proud to announce that. Um, I do want to talk about our academic goals because this is the, the, the heart of our school improvement plan. And we stated as many Scottsdale schools that simply during this school year, 90% of our highly proficient students will remain highly proficient and that 20% of those not highly proficient will increase by one level. Um, we develop in that ELA targets um, for each grade level as well as overall and math targets. Each of those percentages represents a 3 to 5 percent gain in the percentage of students from last year. So those are the targets that we're working towards. So the question becomes how? How do we reach those academic targets? How do we ensure that 90 percent of our students um, that were highly proficient stay there and that we move up another 20 percent of our students? How do we grow that A? Um, so we developed seven strategies to try to meet those academic goals. Um, they're listed there for you. I'll speak of each one of them kind of briefly um, so as not to take uh, too much time. But our, our first strategy that we worked at was rigor. And within rigor, we looked at multiple things. Um, we had a professional development early in the school year um, where we tried to develop definitions um, of rubrics, uh, of what would be rigor, excuse me. And so we had a bell work activity at the start of that. He just list the first five amendments to the Constitution. And we left it and, and just came back to it later on. Um, then we asked them to revise this task to try to make it a higher level deal. Okay, so it was kind of our bell work and our ticket out the door. And some of the, the prompts that the teachers came up with um, were incredible. Things like if you had to eliminate one of the amendments, which one would it be and justify it? So lo lots of good work that came across that we could um, look for opportunities to increase rigor. And then one thing here, if it'll load for us, we've also um, written into our school improvement plan a self-analysis um, of rigor and if this will click over for me um, this is due at the end of this semester um, earlier tonight um, okay we have one more we now have five responses we still have about 10 uh, 10 days before it's due but one thing that i really want to highlight for us all um, is the successes and the challenge that we've had. For us, is this the information we're looking for? Where are our teachers feeling as if they can teach to that level of rigor? And then what are their challenges? How can we better support them as they teach at a level of rigor? And soon we'll have about 80 responses to go with those five that we have, and that'll shape our actions for the rest of the school year. Uh, coming out of this, if I may get back into the presentation, uh, for student engagement, this was an area not only um, represented off of our plus delta days, um, but also through advanced ed as an area of improvement for us. So we wanted to be sure that, that we worked on that. This is probably a, um, an opportunity for me to, to show some humility here. And we have not um, shown the inroads that we've wanted to with student engagement yet, but we are working towards that. In fact, we have now developed a classroom walkthrough protocol with the help of our um, teacher instructional leadership team. That will help us be specifically looking for elements of student engagement so we can get the teachers the feedback that they're looking for. Um, does, does our observation allow for student interactions? Um, if they were there, do we have equal participation and simultaneous engagement? So a lot of the pieces of our engagement um, that we're looking to um, assess, we now have a tool um, that we can utilize quickly to give teachers the feedback that they're starving for. Uh, for professional learning communities, we've made some inroad on this. We do have, uh, uh, the strategy says we'll develop efficient and effective PLCs focused on student achievement. Um, one thing I would like to show you off of this is my teachers um, took part in, a, in an opportunity to build a data analysis protocol. Now, this is absolutely new for us. Uh, we didn't have it at the first uh, benchmark, but we have built this um, data analysis protocol um, that when we finish our second benchmarks here, our teachers will look at their class results, school, class, uh, school level results, 
We'll look at the lowest performing questions, the lowest performing standards, and then there's an action planning section that lists what teachers will do to reteach or, or remedy some, some pieces if we need to. Um, this was a, an opportunity that we took during professional development this year to build, and I'm looking forward to it being in the hands of teachers as we wrap up our um, second benchmarks. Um, literacy across the contents um, is something um, that we've worked some time on. Uh, too often, especially as we get to the secondary level, it almost seems like content versus teaching. Um, social studies, for example, have the reputation of wanting to tell stories. And while that's not necessarily the case at, at Arcadia High School, it does kind of develop this need to teach cross-content and still honor our, the, the professional learning of our teachers. Um, we're excited for our January professional development where we're rolling out common expectations. All of our teachers know in the science, social studies, and technical areas that they have literacy standards. Um, we share that that's in their folders. This January PD is a very exciting for me um, because we, we're working with our ELA leadership team to co-facilitate small group sessions with our social studies teacher, ELA and social studies working together. Another one, ELA and science working together. So we can give our teachers the tools they need and the knowledge they need to be sure that they are able to utilize their content area as a tool to help students develop thinking, reading, and writing skills. And this is something we're very proud of and we're looking forward to that January professional development. Another strategy that we're looking at is varied instructional methods, again from advanced ed reports. Um, this was an area of growth for us. So we have spent the, the first semester with our teacher instructional leadership team, that's TILT, that's what we've kind of nicknamed them, it's catchy, I don't know. Um, and other staff exemplars of various methods of instruction. And we have fortunately, uh, maybe this goes to your question, Ms. Hartman, earlier, of Dr. Thuman, um, we've been able to identify opportunities for peer observation through the support of our PTO who has provided half-day sub-coverages for our teachers to get out and observe other classes. Uh, so we developed a peer observation reflection form, nice and simple, just something for them to look at. The teacher I observed was, I selected this teacher because, a takeaway um, that I have, a question that I have, and what support do you need from your instructional leaders to be sure that whatever you observe, you're able to implement. So this was, uh, again, developed with that teacher instructional leadership team to ensure that we are able to maximize opportunities for that peer mentoring. And, and for us, um, since we're not Title I yet, perhaps we will be, um, was funded through PTO, and we're very um, appreciative for those opportunities. Uh, two quick ones, then I'm going to wrap up for you. We have technology integration. If there's an area we're cooking with oil at Arcadia High School, it might be technology integration. I felt for our IT specialists uh, this week as they've been um, tasked with inventorying all of our devices. So that you know, we have about 1,600 devices that they have ha had to track down and tabulate and, and tabs on them. Um, our technology committee meets every Monday, and they're currently working on um, an instructional apps um, cheat sheet, if you will, for teachers that lists various instructional apps, how they're utilized, and a point of contact on staff who has expertise in it. So if there's um, a Quizit or a Nearpod learning app that puts learning in the hands of, of, of technology and kids, we have a point of contact for the teachers. So we have those instructional apps that, that are being shared out. And finally, this was a big one for us. When we talk to our teachers, um, why are our scores so low? What were some of the causes? They told us, uh, uh, in, in no un uncertain words, some of it comes down to student mindset. Um, so we wanted to, to verify that. So we gave a survey of our ELA students, um, our current 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, about the mindset that they had. And we had about 180 students respond. Um, and they gave us some very telling information besides what grade they're in. Um, when we come down here, why, why do you think you did not try your best? One was we didn't have an incentive to do well. Uh, another one said the passages were too long, so I gave up. That's a stamina issue, and we need to be sure we're teaching to that in, in the classroom. And this was very telling for our ELA teachers, similarly in mathematics, because it told us what we need to work on. And so we have a um, strategy in our school improvement plan that quite simply talks about preparations and student motivation for the AZ Merit. And we're really um, looking for that second semester rollout of AZ Merit tutorials, um, talking about benchmark data with kids, um, always doing your best. We're, we're very excited and we think that we're going to um, cure some of those student preparation issues just by having it out there in the public and a topic of conversations in the classroom and at the school-wide level. 
And then finally, as we wrap up, um, hopefully we're going to be growing the A's there based off of those strategies. We think we've been intentional in building them. Um, we've gone slow to go fast. Um, we're not trying to rush things. We're involving teachers in the input. Um, so we'll see. We, we, we feel as if we're on target for those and it will grow our A. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't share some wonderful things with you. We started with celebrations. If I it could close with celebrations real quick. So what are we doing to fan the flame? When we're not talking school improvement, what are we doing? Well, we're going to the Scottsdale Center for the Arts with a teacher and four students who currently have work on display there for the Ansel Adams um, Vintage Photography. There's four of our students, and it was wonderful um, last uh, two weeks ago, excuse me, to be part of that opening reception. Um, we're bringing in, in our social studies classes, um, the lead prosecutor and defense attorney for all of Maricopa County to talk to our students about what is happening in the criminal justice. What are their rights? What are their responsibilities? What are the procedures? So we're um, involving our local um, lawmakers in that process. Um, we're having our world languages um, decorate our campus for Dia de los Muertos. And we're learning about cultures um, that are not just our own, um, but in this case, um, specific to our Mexican heritage. Um, we're supporting through our CMAS group um, district initiatives. This was from the, uh, the Scottsdale Showcase, where we had our students run the sound and lighting for the entire day. Um, when, we're, when we're not talking school improvement, we're bringing in Representative Sims to talk to our student body president there on the right and one of our teachers for take your legislator to school day so that they're in our classrooms, they're watching, they're interacting with our kids. Um, we're enjoying National Letter of Intent Signing Day. Um, last <laughs> month we had nine, nine student athletes. I'll point out that they're, they're all female, so this is work that we need to do back on, on campus with our, our boys' athletic programs who, <laughs> who signed their letters of intent to go play softball, sand volleyball, golf, at various division one, two, and three schools. So we're celebrating them, their parents, and their success. Um, we, we celebrate students every month with our Titan of the Month luncheon. Um, we bring in every department to nominate a student, to read a passage about them, to honor them, to have lunch with them. Heck, we've even started to, uh, building a Spotify playlist where each one gets to, to put a song in so we can play that in the background during our meetings. Um, and this might be my last photo. But we recognize our national merit uh, semifinalists and our commended scholars. We are doing wonderful things academically at Arcadia. There are very high expectations for academic achievement, and I feel very fortunate and privileged every day to help lead that. That's what we do that fans the flame of learning at Arcadia High School. So with that said, grow the A. May I answer any questions of you? I, 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 I talked a lot. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. I can hear my wife at home right now tapping on her watch, wrap up, Todd, wrap up, Todd. Um, I, I, I would love to answer any questions you have. I love you, honey, if you're listening. Board Member Hartman. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation, Principal yeah. Stevens. Um, great work, thank and you. welcome to SUSD. Thank you. Thank you. So, I appreciate um, we're, that. We're fortunate to have you. Really just a comment more than a question, but I just want to share with you from um, just kind of my background in transformational change. The things I'm hearing you say are really amazing in terms and some of the things that really stuck, kind of um, stood out to me was really how you're using data and how you're courageously using data on data that isn't necessarily, right, it's just the reality, but you're using it in a positive way in how to move forward. I heard you talk about leveraging on the past, and so you're honoring the great work that's been done in the past and, and then building forward. You talked about borrowing from other um, schools and principals and leadership teams and focused on professional development and engagement. And your use of surveys is really amazing across all stakeholder groups, um, students, teachers, parents. Um, I think it's pretty amazing. So I, I, I have no doubt you're going to, if you're doing all of those things um, with the team you have behind you, growing the A is definitely going to happen. So thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. I appreciate those affirmations. I assure you that, that we're doing those things <laughs> and that we're doing them slowly and trying to get our feet under us. Uh, but every artifact you saw, we, we, we have links to in our shared folder. They're, so they're real. And, and thank yeah. you for that. It does matter. And I wasn't questioning that. No, I don't think you were. It no, no, no. It's like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> all right. 
Any other questions or comments? Just a, no. Again, just to commend you, uh, just like the rest of your peers, we're very, very proud of the work going on in all of the schools and um, a, so refreshing to remind us why we're here because in, in reality, I have to tell you, this is where 99% of our work should be, uh, not the color of a building or any of that. It should be in the work that you're doing, and that is fantastic. And so again, and, and I'm sorry I got the frog voice going on, <laughs> principals, but we commend you for your work, for your leadership, for your growth, the McGrell, what you're doing, and it's showing every time one of you step up here, we're just so very, very proud of the work going on in the schools. Uh, again, that's where 99% of our attention should be. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, and I will say in a little healthier voice, maybe a little louder, um, <laughs> thank you again on behalf of the board for um, our, all our educators, our principals uh, who, who stay this evening and shared all the incredible dialogue that's happening on our campuses, the training that's happening. Thank you for being here tonight and being the voice for that work because we know it's happening and we're very proud of it and we certainly know that you are as well. We have informed um, uh, empowered and engaged dialogue happening every day in our campuses that's making learning better in SUSD and we just thank you all for being here and sharing it with us and our community so thank you we look forward to future presentations as well <laughs> all right and now now we are indeed ready for inf next information discussion item eight. Just, just one moment, if I could. Uh, teachers, you came to help with those presentations, and don't feel like you need to stay. We know you have classes tomorrow, so <laughs> we are not insulted if the teachers leave. And principals in the future, um, when you're done with your event, if you don't have a later board agenda, feel free to leave as well um, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next item may be Coronado Success Initiative Update. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I'm insulted. <laughs> okay, it's, it's. President Perleberg, Governing Board members, Superintendent Birdwell. We're very pleased this evening to provide an update on the Coronado Success Initiative. And I'm going to just go through the first couple of slides because the work has been done and led by this amazing person here, Dr. Amy Fuller. We're very lucky to have her expertise and um, working very closely with Mr. Gilmore. And so I'm just going to do the introduction and let her tell you the great things that have been going on. When we started this project, we talked about what were really going to be the, the goals of this project. And we decided all Coronado High School students will be prepared for success and post-secondary opportunities, whether that's college or career, hopefully both. All students will also have the supports and the tools needed to define and achieve personal success. So uh, all, of the, all of these goals came out of much research and collaborations and discussions and input from a variety of stakeholders that talked about what, what is the focus that we need to have for the Coronado Success Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. I uh, just wanted to um, publicly thank Dr. Johnson. She started the Coronado Success Initiative, did a great job, went through very difficult choices and decisions, and um, I want to give her credit for that. Mm -hmm. 
one of the most important tools we have is our partners. We have about 17 partners currently, and they are focused on the personal and academic success of our students. This one. We are starting a, a Coronado Success Initiative mentoring program, and Linda Lyman is our coordinator for this program. Um, this is a pilot program. It will be 10 students and 10 adults, and uh, the first meeting was November 28th. Uh, that we talked about benefiting, uh, the benefits of mentoring, the goals, how youth enters um, the program, and then. There was a follow-up meeting December 5th for those who were unable to attend. And currently, we have already, um, the students are committed and been selected. Parent it, letters have been sent to homes in English and Spanish. And we will follow up in the co next couple of weeks with phone calls to the parents to ensure that they understand what we're asking them to do. Community engagement. One of the things that we've done at Coronado is we brought the ASU American Dream Academy. The first meeting that we had, we had about 100 people there. Well, on Thursday, 91 of them will graduate um, from ADA. So you're invited to come. It will start here. And 91 of them is the largest ADA graduation at SUSD. The prior two hours was Arcadia High School in 2014, graduating 60. Thank you. Our parents. We have been doing our brown bag lunch speakers. And I'll give you a quick example. On September 28th, we have Gene Ford, Assistant Fire Chief for the Scottsdale Fire Department. After his presentation, a mother came to me and said, my daughter is so excited about this. She has a summer internship with the Scottsdale Fire Department. So I went to the kid and said, wait a minute, well, how did this happen? So she said after uh, Mr. Or spoke, she went to him and talked to him about, you know, what all, he mentioned they had other jobs in the fire department. So she wanted to know what other jobs. Anyways, he was so impressed, he invited her to come and do a summer internship at the fire department. Other the brown bag lunches we had October 3rd, we had GCU, October 16th, U of A, the 17th, SEC, October 24th, ASU and October 30th, NAU, and they, this universities rotate monthly. So that was just one example where we hit all of the universities. November 7th, we had Andrew Watkins. He is the research supervisor with the Mayo Clinic. November 30th, we have Women's Leadership Speakers panel. So we have more in the future. Our college and career day, on November 1st, all of our students went to different educational venues. Uh, the freshmen went to EVIT. The sophomores stay in the auditorium to see presentations from SCC. They brought PowerPoints presentations. Many professors came, students came to talk to, to our students. Our sophomores left with folders full of information and en enthusiastic about knowing more about SCC. Our juniors went to ASU and our seniors filled out the college, college applications. That day, 70% of our seniors, we had 228 seniors at Coronado, 70% of them filled out applications. However, prior to that, 30% of them had already filled college applications. So if my math is correct, 30 plus 70, we got them all. Um, One of the things that, we, that they study is, what are the challenges keeping the, study, the students from applying to colleges? Well, 27% say, I don't think I can get in. That's the orange part. 25% say, I can't afford to go. That's half of our students. That's 52%. During our college and career day, and this is just an example I'm going to give you, an ASU student who was helping a Coronado student um, as he was helping him, he noticed his GPA and all of his courses, and he said, you know what? You could probably apply for the scholarships, and you can get some. And so they did a little bit of research, and they found out that this student could potentially get about $20,000 of scholarships. So 
that helps. I mean, the conversation changes when we talk about I don't have any money, and maybe, maybe there is money out there. Um, another thing that we did is um, we have FAFSA, and scholarship opportunities are being shared constantly through college tutors who come to Coronado High School. We have students from ASU who come here to help specific students to either fill out applications, to fill FAFSA, just to get information, help them uh, with anything college or career um, needs. Um, and also we have ECAP. ECAP is Education and Career Action Plan, and that helps that helps because 12% of our students said, I haven't had time to complete this um, application. So after November 1st, that is no longer an excuse because all of them completed an application. And actually we had 248, so we, we had 20 extra ones, which means that some of our students applied to more than one college. All right, and you know, the rest of them, we, we bent to all of them and we met all of the requirements. So very important information for us. The FAFSA nights, we had one September 26th, November 27th, and we have one coming up January 25th. These are um, nights where families are invited to specifically do FAFSA. This is, um, and so families come, we have 35 to 30 <coughs> families of people come in, and we have students and teachers who stay in administrators to help them fill these forms. Another thing that uh, we learned from the from this survey is the building, what, are we building a college community, a college going community? This is a scale from zero to five, and Coronado High scored 3.8. And you know, you can see the different forms, but basically, we're on our way to build a college going community. Another interesting thing that we did is we compare benchmark one of 2017-2018, which is this year, to benchmark one of last year, 2016-2017, and we compare them in two categories, GPA below 2.0, and the F list, which is students with one or more Fs, and the F list was in Fuller. So let me go through this before you hit the roof. The freshmen uh, on the GPA below 2.0 increased 8%. However, on the F list, the freshman decreased 4%. The sophomores on the GPA below 2.0 decreased 56%. And the F list, the sophomores decreased 44%. The juniors on the GPA below 2%, as you can see, decreased 35%. And on the F list, they decreased 43%. The seniors on the GPA below 2.0 decreased 38%. In the F list, they decreased 17%. So at all levels, the GPA below 2.0 decreased 38%, and the F list decreased 28%. Now, the increase on the freshmen, um, the 8%, is not significant. We're not worried at all, because this, this benchmark was done at, at a quarter, first quarter. Now, high schools don't go by quarters, right? We go by semester. So this was an indication that something was going on, but it's normal. If you remember your freshman year in college, right? You take a dip and then you go back up. It's nothing to worry about and it's, it's not something that we're worried. And also, if you remember eighth grade, going to ninth grade, you know, it's going like to a city. A, a, you know, a high school is like a city. There's all these things and all these beautiful girls and these handsome boys and all these <laughs> things, you know, you can't think well. And then same thing happens when you go from a high school to a university or a job, you know, it's a different world. So we're not really worried about that at all. Um, we committed that our teachers will attend two professional days every quarter and the four Saturday professional days have been done and we were very happy. The one on October 21st and November 4th, Tonalia, uh, one of our sister schools, um, attended with us. And we're very happy to collaborate with them. Um, it's, it's much better so we can actually eventually, the, this very cool curriculum, a lot better. If the teachers get to know each other, it's much, much better. 
Um, the reason why I have the faculty professional development, this includes all of the professional development, is because professional development enables educators to develop the knowledge and skills they need to address students' learning challenges. Effective professional development causes teachers to improve their instruction, and if the professional development is for administrators, then it causes the administrators to become better leaders. Continuous professional development ensures that we continue to be competent in our profession. So this is the second part of the faculty professional development, which we're not going to go through, but the ASCOI teach. The goal for CSI on ASCOI teach was to lower the ratio of students per teacher. We currently have 19 interns or student <coughs> teachers, and at some days of the week, our ratio goes um, down to 13 per one, 13 students per one teacher. Now remember that the classroom teacher has all the responsibility. However, having another adult that will become an educator is quite helpful. Now next semester, we have in more. We could have up to 26. We will bring the ratio down to about 11 per one, 11 students per one instructor at times, not every single day, but at times. Before we end, I'd like to thank you. Our gratitude goes out to you. We would like to thank the SUSD board for your vision and commitment to all SUSD students. We would like to thank our superintendent, Dr. Bridwell, for her courage and determination. Her focus is no doubt on students. We would like to thank the entire district for your support and encouragement continually. Our CSI partners and mentors, our parents, community, students. But la last but not least, our Coronado High School administration, faculty, and staff. They work together as a team in order to increase personal and academic achievement for all students. I'm honored to be a part of that incredible team. By the way, this picture was from last night. That's our orchestra. I have to put it in here, Mr. Gilmore. <laughs> See, don't we look classy? That's what you're doing. Yeah. yeah? That's Mr. Lee. All right, you come out. Board Member Hartman. Um, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Fuller and Dr. Johnson and Principal um, Gilmore for just really doing outstanding work and I don't know if I've shared this before but um, just to share with everyone here when I was meeting with the Helios leadership team to talk about um, the Coronado Success Initiative on an unsolicited basis I you know I just started out with sharing who the leadership team was and specifically identified um, the three of you along with um, Dr. Birdwell and um, Paul and Paul stopped me right there and they said you've got the A-team. And um, so they really, on an unsolicited basis, just think tremendously of you, what you've done um, in other schools around the state and districts around the state. And to Dr. Birdwell, really all of these presentations tonight are credited to strong leadership, attracts other strong leadership, which benefits all of our students and our teachers. So thank you all. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any Board Member questions? Kirby? Thank you. I, I just had a comment. Um, as you were presenting, first thank the entire Coronado team for the efforts. As you were presenting, what came through very clear for me is that not only are you just sort of bringing to Coronado what they have needed for quite some time, but it, it's, it's almost overwhelmingly um, at Coronado, and that is ensuring that these students know that they have an adult who is who cares about them on campus mm -hmm. and and so much so will help them through the steps of the way mm -hmm. now it may not be the same adult every single day right, right? Um, but and it may not only it may not just be teachers I mean what I'm hearing is you're bringing in um, many adults from various right. um, walks of life and so at, that that will go a long way with Coronado High School and so I'm um, very optimistic Thank you. about the future of Coronado High School and where this leadership team will take the school. So thank you. Thank you. Just, um, thank you. again, just to, to commend the team, but um, to reiterate, 
it's been done with the partnerships. You saw all those. I mean, it's an amazing how much that partnership has grown. And, how, and I know this mentor program has a list of people wanting to engage, and we're go going slow and staying small to build on success and let it, let it grow forward. Uh, but the ability to have our DSEG dollars go into this school, support the staff, their addendums for all the Saturday training is paid from, from those, the professional development that's been able to be there, our Title I, but it's also our Charles and the foundations and others who have given to this school to let it financially have the focus to do the work that's going on. And um, I just, I can't say enough about the staff and the leadership uh, in, in putting students first. So thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Gilmore, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All set? All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Coronado. Um, all right, so we move on to information discussion item 8C, update on fiscal year 2017 bond expenditures. Not sure how you're going to follow all of that, really. Sorry. Yeah. Now we have to talk numbers. Now we have to talk numbers. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, Governing Board members, Dr. Birdwell, staff, and stakeholders. This is the monthly report that will be loaded in the dashboard once it's presented to you. Um, this is the summary page, which you all are used to at this point in time. Um, we have not converted to the the voter pamphlet that was presented before because we have to get uh, the facility director and myself and uh, the bond Mr. Hartwell in there so we can coordinate it all but once again you can see visions which is our financial software this is the expenditures these are my totals so there's no variance on those uh, yes yes yeah. oh I can see it <laughs> They do, um, oh, here, do, do uh, do, let's see if that does it. There we go. Okay. There go. Oh, cool. See, now I'll share. There. That, in the interest of transparency, let me put that up on the screen. Um, so these are the summaries, and uh, these are the budgets that we had originally uh, put up. And like I said, we have to go to the voter pamphlet and reallocate, but the costs will all be the same. Um, I did not get a chance to do all the encumbrances because that's quite cumbersome to do. They change every month in a great way and there's no uh, easy way to run that report. So um, this is a summary. It links back to these. Um, the athletic fields are pretty exciting because they're almost done and you can see the budget is coming in exceedingly close. Um, and as you know, work gets done, invoices get um, sent and then we pay bills it seems to take a long time um, the bills get paid fast but somehow the work gets done the public can see that first so we're very excited to get that actually done um, and each one of these tabs this has the Cheyenne office hasn't been broken out on the budget so when those invoices come in they'll be reallocated over here Right now, they're in this field um, because it, in the end, it will all be just fine. Um, but the invoice, as it gets finished, will get allocated exactly right. Um, these are the various uh, life cycle projects that have been going on um, and the expenditures that are with that. Um, and I, I'm going to have to change this into a transpose this presentation because the projects keep growing and uh, it no longer goes in there sideways. Um, but Mr. Uh, the facility director brought in all the life cycles that you had approved and he's getting these scheduled out and as the invoices come in, they get allocated to that site. And um, these are the school rebuilds, um, which some of them haven't been totally committed to yet. Um, but you can see the budget is there. Um, these are the only two, this is the only school that has gone all the way through the approval process. 
And this is the summary. So we will continue to get these. Once again, these were the expenditures that were uh, paid for in FY17, which was work done prior to June 30th. And the 18 expenditures are since then. Do we have any questions? Board Member Hartman. I don't have a question um, at this time, but I do want to say that um, I really feel for what you had to endure at the oh, beginning of right. this, um, this meeting. And I do want to say that I have, I'm personally have 30 years in financial accounting, CPA, public accounting partner. I've worked with some of what I believe are the most talented people in the industry, and I would include you among them. You and I have spent much time together looking at the numbers and how to pull them together, and I have 100% confidence in what you are doing behind the scenes. I also know that it is not, a diff it is not an easy story to communicate. Um, it's very complicated, and accounting systems, particularly public school accounting systems, That's true. are not that user-friendly, yeah. and we've spent hours looking at it together. And I just want to thank you for the outstanding work you're doing, and I have, just want to let you know the, my confidence in what you're doing, so thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Any additional comments or questions? Um, I just have a quick one as far as um, clarification. Again, we have this um, available, this Alex. update, correct, mm -hmm. on our site. Is that correct? Yes, or, he will, yes. Um, I will give this to Stephen and he will post that on there. Now remember, these are actual expenditures. And, and that's, okay, so right. there's, that's the report on here, so. Right, yeah. right. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, I just want to clarify that mm -hmm. this is kind of obviously always we're we're getting, if not I'm weekly, sure. from Ms. Helm, but um, <laughs> at least monthly these type of updates through mm -hmm. email, and we know that's being posted. And and I too just want to make the comment that um, having been on the board in the past, <coughs> and um, not having a financial background, but still struggling greatly to have the conversations and the understanding. Um, for these types of uh, financial realities and questions and, and uh, planning. Um, I, I know what it's like to be in, in a very, very difficult place. And as a board member, um, I have not experienced that un under your leadership and, and this leadership as well. Um, I've had very, very strong dialogue in this area. And I thank you as well. Thank you. Um, any other board comments or questions? All right, thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome, thank you. Okay. We now move on to our first action item, 9A, approval of revision of governing board policy BEDB regarding our agendas. Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Birdwell. Uh, we had a discussion about this board policy BEDB uh, entitled Agenda at your study session last Thursday. So that was your first read of the policy and tonight I've brought it back for a second read and possible approval uh, reflecting some of the changes that you discussed possibly making during that first meeting. The suggestion was to uh, change the order of the agenda to move public comment down after information discussion, but still before any action is taken, uh, before specifically before consent or action items on the agenda. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have um, and just allow you to have any further discussion you'd like to have. All right. Anyone like to begin? Again, this does carry, carry on from our conversations Thursday. Um, and I think tonight even highlighted more um, some of the 
comments that all of us made uh, Thursday regarding our last regular meeting and, and what it's like to listen to some wonderful presentations of our staff um, that's very informative about what's re happening in our district, uh, but it being late into the evening and unfortunately um, having most individuals leave by that time. So I know that's that's really was the catalyst for this discussion. Um, we did discuss that last Thursday in our work study, and um, I uh, thank I you. Wanna, if I could yes. just, I, I just want to reiterate that in the principals meeting we had discussion about um, how much they've appreciated coming to the board meetings, but also how uh, difficult it is when you have some really late nights. So principals, I asked you to stay because if the board moves forward this, one of the things that we're, we're going to do in the future is when you've done your information items, if you don't have an action item for the evening, you will be uh, able to go back, go home, and get some rest because you have long days. We're not going to ask you to sit through the whole meeting. We know that you've been bringing faculty with you for presentations and in respect for your professional duties during the daytime to children, we wanted to respect that and let you know that we will not be asking you to stay through an entire meeting in the future. That's correct. Board Member Kirby. Thank you. And what's also very important to highlight here is that uh, public comment before any action, albeit consent agenda or a separate action item, um, will be heard before we take action. So we, we don't have typically public comment during work studies. Um, that's where we do have our conversation that the public can listen to. It makes all the sense in the world to ensure that we have that public comment to give that opportunity to, to the community before we take action. Um, if, it, if it was at the end of the agenda, um, we would miss that as a board. We would not be given that opportunity to hear from our community. So um, I, um, I see this as a compromise to be respectful still of both of all constituents, of our employees, of also um, our community. It's my understanding as well, though, that if this doesn't work, um, we can revisit it. It's also my understanding that this is somewhat consistent with the city of Scottsdale, although I think the city may put it, put public comment after consent. I'm not sure about that, um, but I like this way better. I'm not making an <laughs> argument. Um, so, you know, it works for the city. We can move forward with this if it's an absolute disaster. It's not set in stone. Okay. I will just, remember Hartman. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I was just going to add that uh, we did have that a little bit of that discussion last Thursday too. That even with this, you can on any individual meeting vote to change the order if it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Right. Board Member Hartman. Um, I would agree with all Board Member Kirby's comments. And the one additional point that I wanted to add, as we did discuss it last Thursday as as well, and I thought it was valuable, is that. Um, in this experiment, I think we might find that putting public comment a little bit further um, really allows for the public that's working to get here in time because with our meetings at 5 o'clock, it's sometimes a little difficult to be here. So um, we also talked about being as efficient as possible in the first areas. Um, but hopefully this will even allow even more individuals to be able to participate in um, public comment. So thank you. Absolutely. Board Member Kravitz. I second what Mrs. Hartman just said. And also, I did want to move um, the information discussion items uh, early in our meeting because it reflects the work of what's going on, our, on in our schools. And I think that is most important for people who are in the audience here and watching at home to see that first before they decide the meeting's going on too long and I really can't either stay for the whole meeting or I don't have the time to watch the whole meeting on the video or on the live feed and this way I'll be, they'll be able to see what I consider um, many times the, the meat and potatoes of our meeting. So thank you. Um, and, uh, I agree with this proposal. All right. All right. Any additional questions or comments? Ms. Marshall? No? No, done too? All right, then at that point, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the revision of Governing Board Policy BEDB agenda. Second. 
Thank you, Board Member Kravitz. Sorry. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, we'll move on to action item 9B approval of revised high school and middle school planning guides 2018 19 school year. President Perleberg, Governing Board members, Superintendent Birdwell. I'm very pleased this evening to have my colleague here, Dr. Chris Treat, to present the revised high school planning guide and middle school planning guide uh, to you this evening. <coughs> It was very important for us uh, in the planning process to have the most inclusive group that we possibly could, and in particular to have members from each of the schools represented, both the uh, assistant principals of ed services as well as, well as uh, counselors, our district uh, specialists in the various curriculum areas, as well as key district personnel, the very people who handle the issues that are uh, brought up with, with planning guide and uh, student transcripts and uh, credits, et cetera. So it was very important for us to have all these folks involved, uh, both in physical meetings as well as to be able to be in touch electronically along the path. And um, just want to say one of the things that I think is probably uh, one of the best things that came out of these meetings was our work that we put into in a streamlining the course uh, request and uh, course approval process. Whereas uh, anybody, any of our stakeholders uh, can uh, request to have a course added or possibly changed in our planning guide, um, not to make it difficult, but rather to help us really keep the promise so that we can offer these courses uh, and sustain them over time to make certain that we have the right materials and the right curricular documents in place. And so we had good contributions from our committee members in the creation of that and we've had many uh, submissions as they've uh, worked hard to make certain that all the courses that are currently being offered are in fact in there utilizing that system. And so that's been a, a real uh, positive that we've seen out of that level of communication. Here are the instructional coaches that provided that specialist support. So anytime there was any type of content area question, uh, these are the folks that were brought in. They're the ones that reviewed specifically the language for each of the disciplines. And then they would come in and, com and uh, present to the committee as a whole as to uh, exactly what the trajectories were as well as uh, the detailed descriptions for the courses. And if any of the committee members or others had questions for them, uh, that was a great time for them to get involved in that process as well. And we did the same thing on the middle school committee too. So we had two committees working simultaneously. And I really appreciate uh, all of our secondary principals letting us have these middle school assistant principals uh, counselors as well as the high school assistant principals uh, so that they could physically be present and be involved in this process and the re review of that really important language that goes into this guide. So you see here the dates that we physically met but then we were also in touch electronically fielding questions and moving information about uh, throughout this process uh, throughout the month of September as well as October we have met oftentimes in this very room here uh, to give everyone a chance to get as involved as possible. When we began the process in the high school planning guide revisions we looked at places where we needed to make some changes and additions to make sure that all the courses that were in the guide had been vetted, that they um, also that courses 
that might have been added but weren't in the official planning guide that we got those cataloged and placed in the planning guide. We also discovered that previously we did not have any special education courses in the planning guide, so in working with Dr. Uh, Diane Bruning, our interim executive director of special education, we were able to add uh, scope and sequence for special education courses in uh, the four core areas and other supported electives. We also uh, discovered that um, we need to expand some of our honors uh, um, offerings, not just move straight from a gen ed or a regular course into AP. So we've added honors levels at the second year of world languages and have added honors back in for honors world history geography and honors uh, US history as, as well. We also reviewed all the CT courses and each of the, uh, the pr uh, five principals met and talked about what CT programs they currently have and what direction they might want to go as we plan our uh, CTE course uh, sequences. And so we've added uh, one new sequence, which is the law, public safety, and security. And I already have three of our high schools who are very excited about uh, possibly offering that program. We know that in Scottsdale, we, we're going to have a huge need in that area. We also did technical changes, tried to make our planning guide be more un universal and, and um, the, uh, sort of the accepted way that we name our courses. So we moved the word honors in front of our courses so it was very apparent from the beginning which courses are honors. We also needed to align all of our AP course titles. Some courses uh, here had uh, what I would call a working title, but it's not an official college board uh, title. And when we agree to offer AP courses, uh, we commit to the college board that we will use their uh, AP course titles, their textbooks, and other materials. The other piece that we wanted to add in the high school planning guide, which wasn't apparent in the past, is which courses were core and which courses were elective. And, and when we think about what is the high school planning guide for, it really is for our parents and students, community members, to use this particular item as they're planning and looking at what courses are offered and the programs that are offered in Scottsdale. So for parents, it would be difficult to know which are core courses and which are elective. And particularly when they're working on meeting their requirements for graduation, moving on into uh, college and career, it's very important for them to know that. Also, there was not a designation on how long a course was. Was it one semester or two semesters? And so we've added a section that identifies if the course is a two semester or a one semester <laughs> course. And then we wanted to differentiate honors and AP a little more. Uh, we worked on a, a, a definition. We worked on our course uh, curriculum guides, the course descriptions that would identify particularly the difference between honors and AP. Honors being that it continues uh, adding to our scope and sequence with more depth, depth and breadth, could be adding um, compacting curriculum or accelerating curriculum as opposed to AP, which is actually a college level course and uh, a beginning survey course. So we're adding more of the uh, definition between AP and honors. It doesn't necessarily mean that honors is less rigorous. Honors absolutely can be as rigorous and it should be as rigorous as AP. It's just different content and um, Typically, it expands on content they've already had. Uh, before I move into the middle school planning guide, we had made some corrections after the study session. So I wanted to highlight uh, just briefly the uh, robotics pilot that was approved is now an actual course in the guide. So we have a robotics course and an honors robotics course. And it is listed in the science area, page 87, so I could bring you that information. But I also want to share that 
as a comprehensive <coughs> district with five high schools and over 8,000 high school students, we should be offering a variety of ways um, to, to take curriculum. So we actually have two pathways for robotics. So we have a robotics course and an honors robotics course that um, is taught as an elective in the science. We also have a CTE pathway, which is called um, Engineering Design 1, 2, and 3. It's a three-year approved program for engineering design. In that course, they're also able to teach robotics as one of their areas in engineering design. So some of our schools choose to teach robotics in their engineering design program through CTE, and some of our schools use the robotics. Part of it is who, the certification of the teacher. Are they certified to teach CTE? Sometimes it's um, pathways that the students want to choose. So we want to offer a variety, uh, two modalities to be able to uh, participate in robotics. Um, the CTE also leads to industry certification. So if students really want to focus more on the engineering design, it also prepares them for uh, college work, those that want to go on in into engineering, for example. In the middle school planning guide, we, uh, we noticed uh, when we reviewed it that the middle school uh, process uh, sort of continued the elementary process when it came to what elementary typically calls the specials or work on a wheel type um, offering for electives. And in, in, uh, in identifying what the middle school is for, it's that bridge between elementary and, it's in, and moving into high school. So middle school is an opportunity to try a variety of different courses, uh, experiment in different topics and subjects, but it also is preparing them for what happens when they get to high school. So we, uh, con we contacted all the um, high school or the middle schools and Chris worked with all the middle schools to codify using the new course proposal form what courses they wanted to include in the middle school planning guide that they already were teaching and, um, and which schools have those particular courses such as Cheyenne Traditional Academy offers a humanities course and so that's in the planning guide and uh, indicates that it's only being offered at Cheyenne Traditional Academy. We wanted to also look at how we record um, eighth grade uh, credit when it comes to taking a high school course in eighth grade and align that with accepted practices in, um, as, as we prepare them for university and making sure that we include the work they do in eighth grade that contributes to fulfilling high school requirements. So we have, we have delineated that a little bit better where we say um, if we offer in SUSD high school courses in eighth grade, which would be the Algebra One and World Language courses, they would be able to earn high school credit and it will go on a high school transcript with the course name and grade, but it will not be figured in the GPA or the class rank, but we want it to count as one of their four years of math and one of their two or three years of foreign language to fulfill that university requirement. And then um, we, we also, as we're working on acceleration, we do offer honors geo trig, and, um, and that one is figured in the GPA or uh, class rank. It's an honors level, higher level work for our eighth graders. And, it should be included in the GPA and class rank. And that concludes our presentation. All right. Board Member Kirby. Thank you um, for the presentation. Again, we did discuss this last Thursday. We spent quite a bit of time on it. I just have a few, three questions, one comment. Um, I'll start with the comment. Thank you for adding the robotics to the high school planning guide. Um, and to all my colleagues who told me it was in there, I, tr I trust you, but I verified and it wasn't. So <laughs> um, thank you for adding that. Uh, thank you also for adding um, the world history honors. Uh, did I hear you say US history as well? Mm -hmm. Yes, we added yes. that. You also. added that as honors also? Yes. Awesome, thank you. Question. Two questions that have come up from the community that I have asked you 
um, but I, I think it's worth a, a brief discussion, mm -hmm. is why no honors world language three and four? Do you want to answer that question? World language three and four are typically um, the AP courses. I, or excuse me, I'm sorry. World, I got that confused with the ELA. Mm -hmm. World language uh, three and four, this is where you're typically jumping up a uh, level in uh, difficulty from that two to three. It's a substantial jump, and so just going to that honors is really, uh, it's worthy of that grade point. Uh, they've gone out of their way to add literature components to that world language three and world language four to go ahead and make it more robust. And it also has a much smaller population of students who are uh, taking those courses at that point. And so it's uh, trying to meet the needs of the students that are, that are there. Thank you. And um, you also shared that reply on email. And that actually is intuitively makes sense to me because we don't require world language for, to graduate. Right. And so it does make sense that we have a smaller population. Mm -hmm. um, which leads me to another comment, but I think Board Member Hartman may address it, so I'll let her handle it. We talked about that as well at the work study. Finally, the last question that came from the community um, that I asked and you answered, I am not suggesting that we change it for this year because this would be a monumental systemic change that maybe we shouldn't even consider doing it. But intuitively, um, I just don't understand why honors and AP would be weighted the same. And um, I was looking at other high school planning guides for various things. I wanted to see what they put uh, you know, for graduation requirements. And I, wanted, I just was looking at different things. And I looked at the weighting. Mm -hmm. High schools are all over the board on this. Public district high schools in Arizona, they do, they take different approaches. And so as I thought through the question, um, and I am going to ask for this as a future agenda item because I certainly am not asking you to change it for this year. But does, does it not, should we not be also considering what are the colleges and universities looking at? What are, do they consider AP and honors the same, the same weighting? Um, and maybe the answer is depends on the college or university, <laughs> right? But I, I would like to just understand that better because intuitively it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Member Kirby, we, uh, as I uh, put in the email back to you, we have begun conversations. We talked in the leadership of teaching and learning. We also have talked in our, with our high school principals about, about that, looking at pros and cons and, and what, is it, what is the thinking. Um, we also want to talk about the why. What, why would we do that? Um, we, we know that all universities unrank when they look at a transcript because there's no universal national um, approach to weighting a particular course over, over another course. Um, it, it also has to do with philosophy. Uh, we very much consider our honors courses rigorous and I know under the uh, leadership of Executive Director Cheryl Redner and her team, uh, Dr. Treat, are working at what does rigor look like in an honors course compared to an AP course? What is the difference? So we're doing, I, I believe, a lot of exploration and a lot of discussion about that. It, there's not necessarily one way is better than another way. It, it really has to do with um, personal preference uh, by district, what, what they would like to do. Thank you, and, and I'm, I'm happy that you're having those conversations. That's really what I was hoping to hear, is that to the team is talking about it, and then you know, maybe in the next six to eight months, we can just have a, where did, what did you decide, and why? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I agree, I'll definitely be adding that to our future agenda, because when, whenever you bring up uh, the, the philosophies you know, of our educators, our teachers, our principals, um, I especially get quite engaged because to have a shared vision of, of the mm -hmm. philosophy of how we're teaching our kids is incredibly important in my mind. So I look forward to those conversations as well. Board Member Hartman. Thank you. Um, uh, one question, two comments. So thank you for the thorough presentation and follow on from Thursday. Um, my first my question is related to the high school planning guide and um, 
um, graduation requirements. We talked about this on Thursday, so what Board Member Kirby was referring to. Um, my question was, was the language strong enough for parents to understand that if their child wants to pursue, or they're anticipating at least pursuing an out-of-state post-secondary college experience, um, is the wording strong enough to um, ensure that they meet um, the counselors? And when I went back to the page and graduation requirements, the language has changed, so you've updated it. I'm just wondering if it's still strong enough. Um, I just, because of the sentence, right, it's buried in the guide, and I guess if you want to be proactive, you'll find it. But right now it says, um, any student planning to pursue post-secondary education should determine the entrance requirements of the school he, she plans to attend optimally by the end of the sophomore year, which is a true statement. Um, but I'm wondering if we should call out particularly out-of-state schools because this whole page is designed for the four in-state universities. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Um, Member Hartman, the, uh, we, we um, discussed that at length and the uh, and we have a model that has uh, district requirements a table has district requirements state requirements in-state university requirements and out-of-state university requirements and so we've got a couple of models that we've looked at for tip for um, enhancing that I think um, the committee really liked the visual and so we wanted to honor the committee's work but I believe we're going to have further conversation. And absolutely, as we roll this out and in our meetings with the APs of Ed Services and all of our counselors, we are going to equip them better with more understanding the, um, the out-of-state requirements, make sure that they're working with the, the parents and students about that. Okay, so these are just for clarification, the models that you're referring to are not in the high school planning guide, but are they some type of template or document that all the counselors have in their hands or I'm, I'm not sure what you're referring to the the initial um, page that we have we have enough we have other examples from other school curriculum guides that have more of a table so that it has the four columns that would be district state requirements in state universities and out of state universities so it's, it's a little bit clearer in some other planning guides and then we're going to, uh, as, as we've started this year, doing more training with our counselors and equipping them with the information. So they, each school does create their own registration materials. And we also have um, more training with the Naviance, which does our ECAP, which is another way that we're going to be using the tools that our counselors are going to use with the students and parents to talk about um, what their choices are, what's available, not only in-state, but out-of-state. So. Uh, much more emphasis on providing that information uh, in one-on-one -on -one and in individual classes with students. Okay, I appreciate the I appreciate the follow-up, and it sounds like it's a continuing discussion as well. Okay, um, the just other two comments I had. One, I do want to also acknowledge. Um, I appreciate the add back of honors particular in U.S. history, world history. Um, just as a parent of um, two children, one was an AP student, one was, you know, just kind of middle of the road, and his experience with honors was really kind of a stretch opportunity, and so that was really um, an enriching, positive experience. So adding that back, I think, actually benefits a lot of kids in our district. And then last comment was on, we talked a little bit this, about this on Thursday, too, related to CTE. Um, there's a continued focus and to continue to add CTE classes and the initial cursory look at the comparison across the high schools Coronado was a little bit lighter on that but we had talked about that was going to be a continued focus as well in a future agenda item is that correct yes okay all right thank you or member Kravitz I'm not trying to edit from the bench but <laughs> if um, <laughs> The one key sentence for me at the bottom of page five is any student planning to pursue the post-secondary yada yada yada. Sticking that up at the top of that page after entrance into Arizona four-year university and making the font larger 
because <laughs> I can just hear, I didn't see it, I didn't know, uh, you know, why was it down at the bottom of the page, et cetera. So if we can lift that up, that way we're ju juxtaposing what is required for in-state versus out-of-state, it, it, it may be a little bit clearer. I, I also want to note that it, the book is one means of a communication, but I, I want to also reiterate that all the principals run multiple college nights as well. Right. And they also um, emphasize that. So I just want you to know there's also a lot. We want to hit parents with this information multiple times. Okay. Thank you, Board Member Kirby. Thank you. I'm going to weigh in. I completely agree. <laughs> and I, I appreciate that we hit it multiple times, but. This is, a, this is a document that's memorialized, and it is the first place many parents go. Um, it's the first place I went. You go to the course guide. And um, I, I think what you're hearing tonight from at least three of us is that it needs to be called out more than it currently is, however you choose to do that. Um, otherwise, because again, that's what's good for kids, is to, that they clearly know and their parents clearly know up front if they have a desire to go out of state or private, what those requirements are as compared to what we have on that sheet right now. I think it also addresses our customer. We, we do have a lot of families seeking out of state post-secondary and we need to make sure that we're catching that. Mm -hmm. I'll make that change. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll just add, I said this last Thursday as well. Um, I am very happy to see those honors uh, classes back in there as well. And, and many of the changes to me in this um, guide show our commitment, our dedication to increasing rigor in our district. It, it really speaks to the direction that we're heading these changes. Very happy with it. Um, so thank you. At this time, do we have a motion? Board Member Kirby. No motion yet. Okay. Um, we, I think some discussion. Personally, calling out the um, out-of-state and private universities requirements is very important to me. And I think that's an easy change. It's yes. not a big philosophical. No. So it's how do we want to hand? Uh, it's just me. If I'm the only one, then we can. Okay. So do we, do we say as amended? Mm -hmm. Yes. And we need language tonight. Do we get you guys to change it, just bring it back next time we meet? Because no, I think we're meeting. Or yeah. I see Dr. Tree. He's like, yeah. oh, we're up again. Are we going to get to deadline? Um, yeah. yeah. So if, if someone can help with the. Yeah. I think it says the staff is directed to amend the language for mm -hmm. focus on out of state yeah. universities. Okay. That works. That. Yeah. okay. Yeah. So. Just put it in, to, when you put the motion forward, emphasize well, as the staff is directed. Yeah. And, and I'll give the staff opportunity. Do you want clarification regarding that direction, those statements? I mean, yeah, no. I, I think we can, yeah, I think we can it. with uh, trust, trust staff with the yeah. semantics of it and the, you know, how it's phrased, but are, feel confident and clear in Just, the direction? Yep. No, I understand. Okay, so, all right. So then, would you like to? I don't know what motion to make. Step in a motion? Um, all right, then I'll make a stab at a motion. Um, so I make a motion that the Governing Board approve the proposed revised high school and middle school planning guides effective for the 2018-2019 school year as directed this evening by the Governing Board. Do I have a second? Is that good? No? All right, I tried. Sorry. I tried. Sorry. Thank you, Ms. Marshall. I should have called on you first. That's, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> um, I would say that the board uh, approves as amended. I, would, I want you to specify the... Sorry? What, the, what are you saying? Yes, I want you to specify the focus on... And I need help with the words on the out of state out of university, state university information. information in your motion. So approve as amended to include the out of state university information. Does that cover it? Yes. Okay. All right. So is, is that language, you're comfortable with that language mm -hmm. as, as amended okay. with the so out of state? Moved. Okay. All right. So moved. <laughs> uh, do I have oh, a second? A second. 
Thank you, Board Member Hartman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion passes 5 0. Thank you all. Okay, that moves us right along to agenda item 10 future items. Board members may propose topics for future consideration. Um, we've already added one this evening. Do I have any additional ones? Board Member Hartman. Um, I would like to acknowledge that we did not get to um, policy update CBI-E, which is superintendent evaluation. I do also want to acknowledge a lot of good work is going on behind the scenes. So um, as soon as we get that pulled together, and I'm also willing to contribute to what that document or that policy might need to look like, I'm happy to do so as well. So I'd like to see it on a future, maybe the January we can accomplish that the January meeting if not no later than fe February right. specifically regarding the evaluation tool update correct well the policy which and, and references the, policy the language tool that references yeah. the outdated tool okay I understand um, all right any additional comments questions no all right then we will move on to our next item uh, 11 dates of upcoming meetings our next special governing board meeting is Thursday January 11th 2018 at 3 p.m. we have uh, that, December no. 14th meeting this we'll Thursday correct. and then we have a December 19th um, meeting as well special meeting a special meet that's correct and okay so this Thursday, th those are two executive meetings, just to two be clear. Executive two executive sessions Executive uh, sessions, Tuesday the 19th. The time on that, I believe, was set as noon. Starts at noon. And that is a special meeting at to be held at the uh, Mojave District Annex, correct? Correct. Principals okay. do not attend. All right. So just for those clarity, <laughs> yes. Yes. Do not we attend next meeting. Tuesday either. <laughs> okay. So there's clarity there. And then, yes, our next special additional governing board meeting uh, Thursday January 11th 2018 3 p.m. also at Mojave District Annex and our next regular governing board meeting is of course here Tuesday January 16th 2018 at 5 p.m. Um, do we have we'll move on to agenda item 12 governing board reports do we have any this evening board member Hartman Thank you, and I'll keep it brief since it's it's pretty late um, but I did want to acknowledge um, a couple things um, from since the last meeting um, I had the uh, once again the privilege and um, honor to continue to support the CSI Advisory Committee attended the meeting on November 14th and um, it's just something I'm just really passionate about um, and I think of those 17 partners um, I, I think probably 10 or 12 of them are just personal relationships that I continue to want to support and help support in connecting resources with our community. Um, also, on 11-28, um, I did have the um, opportunity to participate in the Coronado High School Mentor Program, so I'm pretty excited about um, helping identify those um, initial pilot mentors and um, excited about what that program can look like and the opportunity to expand that in the future. And then last, um, last week on December 7th, um, as part of the Charles Foundation, had the opportunity to represent um, CSI as well as just overall um, support with um, the Charles and SUSD progress in the initiatives that we're partnering together. And um, really want to acknowledge the work that the, the Charles continue to do to support um, our district um, in many ways, not only treasure, but time and talent as well. So thank you. Board Member Kirby. Thank you. Uh, on December 2nd, Board Member Kravitz and I were invited by Desert Mountain High School to attend the FACTA First Arizona Conference for Technology Advocacy. It's a, it was a robotics conference where they um, basically taught the community um, what to expect, what these programs were like from elementary all the way to high school. I learned so much. And then um, I didn't tell her, so she's hearing this for the first time tonight, when I was at Tavon, um, I was, had the opportunity to visit um, a classroom that had some robotics activity going, and I put to use what I learned in that advocacy about you should be able to talk to any robotics student, at, in, in, depending on the grade, and ask them this, and they should be telling you this. And it proved to be true. 
Um, so it's, I'm learning robotics. Um, it's new to me. It's not really my thing, but I'm, I'm fascinated by it. So I um, wanted to share that and thank both Desert Mountain and Tavon. Very exciting. Very exciting. All right. Um, that looks like about it. Thank you all for hanging in there with us tonight. Do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. So moved. Thank you. That was slow, Board Member Kirby. Do I have a second? Second. And thank you, Board Member Harpin. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Good evening, everyone. <laughs>